that period as well. Yes. Uh, so I was, I was going to say, you, during that period, you, you were a consultant physician yes. at various UCL hospitals. Yes. Um, uh, and then in 2006, your career um, took another turn, uh, and you spent from 2006 to 2018 uh, working for GlaxoSmithKline. Yes, I was a global president of research and development for them. Um, and then, and this, of course, is the period with which we're most concerned, um, in April 2018, uh, your career took a another turn, uh, and you were appointed on that date uh, as government chief scientific advisor, um, and you remained in that post until March of this year. Yes. And uh, when you uh, left that post in March, you were succeeded, um, is this right, by Dame Angela McLean, uh, who the inquiry will be hearing from in due course. Yes. Let, let me, um, again, by way of, uh, sort of preliminary um, matters, um, ask you about two further documents, um, Sir Patrick, beyond your witness statements. Uh, and the first of those is the technical report. Um, we have it on page now. Uh, we see um, the first page. Uh, it's described as a technical report for future UK medical officers, government chief scientific advisors, national medical directors, public health leaders in a pandemic. Um, we can see that it was dated December of last year. Uh, and it's right, isn't it? I, I don't think we need to, to look at this. But you were one of um, a series of authors of this document, uh, the other authors including uh, Sir, Chris, Sir Chris Whitty, the um, chief medical officer, uh, and other um, uh, his deputies uh, and others. Is that right? Uh, the chapters were all written by different experts, and uh, Sir Chris and I and the other um, deputy medical officers and, and, and medical officers from the devolved administration acted as sort of an editorial um, team to try and make sure that we ended up with the finished product that we thought would be useful. Um, we, we, we may go to certain passages within this, this document as we... Um, as we go through matters today. But with, with that uh, title in mind, can you just expand on that slightly and give us an idea of what the, what the purpose of this document was? The purpose of this document was to try to understand a few things about what had happened during the current pandemic from a technical perspective and to try to draw from that and other evidence what useful things might be for a future um, as it says, chief medical officer, chief scientific advisor or others, to be able to look at it and say, well, there are some things there that we need to take notice of. So some of them are recommendations about what should be put in place now in order to make sure that you get the preparedness and the structures right. And some of them are things that we think would be useful for people to look at, should there, which I'm afraid there will be at some point, be another pandemic. Not because you can predict what that pandemic would look like, because each one will be different, but there are some generic lessons in there that we thought would be helpful for people to understand. Yeah. So this, this document, if you like, sits alongside your witness evidence um, as drawing on some very similar themes. It does. Um, thank you. Let me um, move on to a different set of documents um, by way of introduction, and that is uh, the evening notes um, that... The inquiry has already heard something about. And, and it's right, Sir Patrick, isn't it, that in response uh, to a disclosure request made by this inquiry, uh, you produced a, a lengthy set of personal notes that you wrote during the pandemic. Uh, you produced them to us. Uh, and um, just to be clear about this, um, although those notes contained some very sensitive um, personal entries, uh, you disclosed the notes in full to the inquiry, um, as it were, at the first time of asking. Yes, I did. Um, you describe um, something about those notes in your witness statement. And I wonder if we can go to paragraph 474, please, on page 157. Uh, and you describe here um, Sir Patrick, that the, the, your practice of writing these notes uh, started um, as a means essentially of protecting your own mental health, given the uh, stress um, that you were experiencing on a daily basis. You wrote them, the term has been used as, a, as something of a brain dump um, at the end of each day. Um, is that right? Yes, at the end of each day, 
often quite late in the evening, I would just spend a few minutes jotting down some thoughts from that day, some things and reflections, and did it as a way to get that, in a sense, out of the way so that I could concentrate on the following day. Uh, these were private thoughts. They were instant reflections from a day. And um, once they were written, I, I actually never looked at them again. I mean, they were, they were put in a drawer, and, 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 and that was that. And I certainly had no intention of doing anything else with them either. Um, just on that last point, um, no intention to publish them or use them as a basis. We've seen various people who are involved in the pandemic, including some of your scientific colleagues, have written memoirs or accounts of their time. Did you think you might draw on these notes? I, I had no a... intention whatsoever of these ever seeing the uh, light of day or me looking at them again. And I sort of felt the world had probably had enough of uh, books of reflections of people's uh, thoughts during COVID. Um, if we can go over the page, please. Um, at paragraph 478, so that's the bottom of the next page, um, you, you make the point, you've already said they, these notes were written quickly um, at the end of the day, um, but you then add um, that, that, that perhaps obvious point that they weren't intended, they, that they couldn't perhaps have been a considered um, analysis of events. Um, reading on, you say you've never gone back to them, you didn't edit them, you didn't, as it were, um, add to these thoughts things that happened later or, or any further reflections. It, are those important matters that we need to bear in mind when, as we will, we, we look at some of those notes? I, I think they are. I mean, from my perspective, these were a way of just decompressing at the end of a day, and they were some thoughts I'd had that day and wrote down that day, as I say, in order to be clearer the following day that I was going to concentrate on the following day. And they had no purpose other than that. And nobody, including uh, members of my family or anyone, had seen them or I had any intention of showing them to anybody. You've obviously, um, much more recently, in the last weeks and months, looked back at many of those notes. Would it be fair to say, then, that some of them, um, some of the notes you made, uh, reflect thoughts which you still think, in fact, are accurate, and perhaps others you would wish to qualify or even disown? Yes, I mean, some, some of it I look back and think, well, that seems like a sort of sensible series of reflections over that period. Others I look back and I can see I might have written something one day and then two days later written something that said, actually, I don't agree with myself on that, yeah. um, which may have been how somebody had behaved or somebody had made an observation. So they were very much um, instant thoughts. Um, and we will bear all those things in mind when, as we will, we look at some of these notes um, later today. May I just ask a um, rather practical point about these notes? Um, I think there's at least one um, section of the notes which actually um, are notes that you took during a meeting, um, the meeting of the 20th of September uh, with Professor Gupta and others. Um, but by and large, as you've said, is this right? You remembered things that took place during the day and then wrote about them in the evening? Yeah, I might have scribbled the occasional thing down on a bit of paper during the day and then looked at it in the evening. But um, they were, so they were a mix of things I might have noted at the time and things that I noted in the, in the evening. And as I'm sure you've had the pleasure of realising, my handwriting is not exactly excellent. <laughs> Well, You're I'm, a doctor, Sir Patrick. I know. I'm glad to say that that, that is a task that um, others in our team have had to grapple with, Sir Patrick. Um, but I, I just wanted to pick up that, the point you made about making notes during the day, because when we look at the notes, we see that quite often there are direct quotations that people who you're in meetings with said. Might that then be something that you made a note about at the time and then... And then put into your notes later, or, or would that just be your best memory it, later in the day of what they it, said? It could have been either of those things, and I might have just jotted down the quotation on a bit of paper yeah. during the day. You've mentioned your, your handwriting, Sir Patrick, and um, just, just for clarity, um, in terms of the process, you provided us, didn't you, with your manuscript notes, the originals that you, that you wrote. Um, those have then been transcribed into a typed version um, and a further exercise has taken place to capture certain excerpts which have been put into a schedule. Um, and during the course of today, we, we will be looking 
mainly at the schedule of excerpts and a little bit at the transcript, but happily not at the manuscript version at all. Um, I'm going to move on uh, and, um, again, by way of introduction, ask you something about your role um, as Chief Scientific Advisor before the pandemic, um, in peacetime, if you like. Um, we've heard that you were appointed in April 2018, and um, one assumes that the first year and three quarters or so of your term uh, was very different from the latter period. Uh, yes, it was. Um, you, you have set out in your first witness statement for, for module one um, a, a, a degree of detail about all the things that the role of government chief scientific advisor entails. Um, and I, I'm don't, not going to go to that statement in any detail. But, but it is apparent from that statement um, that there is far more to that role than the fairly narrow function very important function, but fairly narrow function that you performed during the pandemic. C can you, in a few sentences, give us an idea of, of the breadth of the role that you were performing, perhaps particularly in, in that first year and a half or so? The role of the Government Chief Scientific Advisor is to provide science advice for policy rather than policy for science. So it's to try to ensure, and the job reports to the Cabinet Secretary and is accountable to the Prime Minister and Cabinet, that areas of policy consideration and thinking can be informed by science advice, whether short-term or long-term. Um, that means areas like climate were a big focus of my attention, um, areas like what the science system was in government and was it adequate to provide that right the way across every department and areas like how the science base could be best harnessed to think about innovation and areas that might be relevant to the economy were the sorts of things that uh, I was involved with. And indeed, even during COVID, those things continued. So I was the chief scientific advisor for COP26 in Glasgow as well on behalf of, uh, of the government at that stage. So there, there are many different areas that this role covers. Um, and there's a separate chief scientific advisor in each department as well. Yeah, it is, it's a very important um, fact for us to bear in mind, is it not, that although, of course, so much of your work during the pandemic uh, was based on medical matters, which tallied with your own training, uh, the role of, of chief scientific advisor covers a far broader canvas. You've mentioned the environment. I think there's a reference in your statement or possibly the notes to uh, matters to do with space exploration, dams overflowing, uh, Novichok in Salisbury, a, a whole range of, of scientific matters in normal times. Yes, and, and I, I would characterise that in three blocks. The science for everyday matters of policy in government, which covers everything, as you said, from things like um, um, space exploration to uh, transport to other areas. There's a second block, which is in emergencies, and in my time, uh, there was an emergency obviously relating to Novichok in Amesbury and Salisbury. There was one relating to the potential collapse of the Todbrook, uh, the dam at the Todbrook uh, Reservoir. Um, and the third is um, science as it relates to economic matters as well. Yeah. Um, du during um, that first period of a year or so before the pandemic, um, you, you were involved with, and I think commissioned, something called the Science Capability Review, and this is something you, you discuss in your witness statements. Um, can you give us a little detail of, of that exercise? Uh, and also, um, can you tell us whether there were any, any issues that emerged from that exercise that subsequently you felt were relevant to the way in which the pandemic was dealt with? Yes, uh, that was an exercise undertaken together with Jeremy Hayward, who was the then Cabinet Secretary and the Treasury, to ask the question, was science capability adequate in the government for what I saw then as a central plank of what all modern governments need to know about? And the work which was published in 2019 identified a number of areas First, that the funding for science had decreased across many departments, and that left departments somewhat disabled in their ability to use science. Uh, second, that the departments needed a chief scientific advisor who was more than a lone operator, that he or she needed a structure around them to be able to do it. 
and a series of observations about um, public sector research establishments and other parts of the government system. But perhaps the most sort of striking headline, in a way, was the realisation that the fast stream, so the graduate intake programme for the civil service, where future permanent secretaries and leaders of the civil service come from, um, had an intake which comprised 10% of, uh, of the intake uh, comprised people with a STEM degree. So 90% was arts, humanities, um, social science degrees, and, and only 10% was a STEM degree, which struck me as being um, something that would destine the civil service to stay roughly in the same position as it has been for quite a long time. Yeah, it was actually that last point that I wanted to pursue with you. It is a striking statistic. Perhaps it's obvious, but what... What was the effect of having only 10% of these leaders of the civil service with a, with a STEM, with a science technology uh, training? Well, it, it means two things. It means that the um, routine consideration of science in policy formulation was not where it needed to be. Now, you can do some of that with the scientists trying to be round the table giving information. But the second is that it also meant that there isn't always a good... Um, receiving system for science because um, a way of thinking it's different from uh, perhaps how others approach a problem and that meant it wasn't always easy to get the right sort of pull for science across the civil service and I'm really pleased to say I should say that the uh, as a result of that report there's now a target to have 50 percent of the intake with a STEM degree which which I think is about right it shouldn't be 90 percent the other way either. Yes and uh, do you know do you know whether that target has been reached or, or how, how, how it's doing? The target is set for, to be reached by 2024, and I'm going to look with interest from the sidelines to see whether it's achieved. All right. Turning then to your role um, during the pandemic, Sir Patrick, at, at, a, at a very high level, um, those who have been following this inquiry, reading the documents <coughs> and so on, uh, m might uh, think of your role uh, as falling into three parts. First of all, your, your management role at Go Science, uh, managing, providing structure to those generating scientific advice, uh, in particular, of course, chairing SAGE. Uh, secondly, um, a role providing personal advice to the Prime Minister and other key decision makers. Uh, and thirdly, a presentational role, um, explaining scientific advice to the public of course, in, in the press conferences that we're all familiar with. Um, in broad terms, is, does that capture it, or, or, or are there other important aspects that you think um, we need to think about? I think in terms of the work during the pandemic, those three categories are reasonable, although, of course, they're all quite broad. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we won't be saying very much um, today about your role um, regarding vaccines, because, of course, that's going to be the subject of another module, but um, particularly given your, your background and your work uh, with um, GlaxoSmithKline, you had a, a considerable role to play, did you not, in the development of the vaccine programme? Well, I set up the Vaccines Task Force um, in order to get the appropriate skills and focus on what I saw as a major, major issue for uh, the world to get uh, vaccines uh, in time and of the right, uh, right type and to get them available, in this case, into the UK. Um, in terms of the, the second of those three uh, limbs, the, the role providing personal advice, and as we will see, in, usually that was orally to the Prime Minister um, and his advisers. Um, initially, is this right, that was a function you performed at COBRA meetings. We, we've, we've all seen the COBRA meetings that took place in the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, and, and latterly, it, it became something that you did at other committee meetings and also less formal occasions at number 10. Um, well, the personal advice element, of course, went to the uh, Cabinet Secretary and others as well. It wasn't just to the Prime Minister. Uh, the COBRA system really was a place where the output from SAGE came into a ministerial forum and where other outputs would come as well. So that is the place where, certainly in other emergencies, I'd seen it work well, 
where different inputs, whether it's economic, whether it's um, science, whether it's something else, come together. Ministers uh, make decisions, and there's an operational structure, which is the Civil Contingencies Secretariat, that would then make sure that the output of that was properly handled across Whitehall. So that had worked well in the previous emergencies I talked about, and that was the structure that was in place at the beginning of COVID. Yes. I'm getting, and we, we will come back to, to explore in a bit more detail how well that worked and issues around the term of doc, how your advice was, is to be docked and how that might be reflected in future occasions. I wanted, to, though, at this stage just to clarify with you just how, how frequent those occasions were and how we should regard your role. Uh, the sense being this, that the inquiry has now heard from several witnesses who had as their full-time job advising the Prime Minister. They were with him all day, every day, um, they would spend, it seems, much of their days during this time talking to him about what uh, steps should be taken, whether that's civil servants or his political advisers. Um, how different w was your role to that? Oh, very different. I mean, it's not a role that, that lives in Cabinet Office or in Number 10. Uh, we came in, in the case of COBRA, to come in to give advice in the COBRA meeting and then subsequently, as things ramped up and there were daily meetings in number 10, um, I might be in there for 45 minutes in a meeting in the morning and then perhaps not at all till the following day or sometimes not, not every day. So th this was an intermittent time to give science advice. I wasn't living and breathing the policy or operational aspects and didn't have a policy or operational role. That's for others who are embedded in that system yes. to, to do. And I think it's also worth noting that, that um, prior to the emergency, um, I'd met the Prime Minister probably on a couple of occasions and then met um, uh, uh, Mrs May before that on three occasions. And I think I'm right in saying that my predecessor, Mark Walport, actually didn't have a meeting directly with Theresa May. So it wasn't as though the science advisors in and out of number 10 the whole time. That obviously came to be the case during COVID, but, but it, was, it was for specific purposes. And we'll come to see that there certainly were times where you were meeting the Prime Minister on a daily basis. Yes. But not all day, and there would be some meetings that you attended and then you were asked to leave and other meetings would go on in your absence. Is that fair? Yes. Um, you, You've mentioned already, but for completeness, although, of course, your work was so heavily focused on the pandemic during this time, were you, in fact, also required to perform the, some of those other duties we mentioned about matters completely unrelated to COVID? Yes, there was a chief scientific advisor network that continued that obviously kept that going in departments. As I said, I uh, was asked to lead um, science for COP26, uh, the climate conference in Glasgow, to make sure we had that side of things right. And there was work going on on things like the integrated review, the position of the UK in, in the world, which had a big science theme in it as well. So work like that continued, um, and Go Science continued to produce other reports, but was, of course, the absolutely major focus was at all times on, on the pandemic, and that took precedence over everything else. Yes. Um, could I ask you to look at a paragraph 13 of your witness statement on page 9, please? Um, and picking it up about half the way down, um, you say it was by chance that as Chief Scientific Advisor you had a background uh, in med medicine and pharmacology. Uh, you say that, as we've already noted, um, the person filling that role could come from any scientific discipline and is expected to cover all scientific areas. Uh, and you say it would be wrong to expect, and this perhaps follows from what you, you've said, that any future scientific advisor would have specialist knowledge on medical or epidemiological matters. Um, first of all, given your no doubt, fortuitous um, experience in medicine and pharmacological matters. Did you, on reflection, do you think that you played a, a, a greater role in responding to this pandemic than perhaps you might have done if your speciality had been different? I think the role of the GCSA would still be to, sh uh, to chair SAGE, and during a health emergency, that's to get done together with the chief medical officer. I think that would have continued. Um, I think inevitably there were some aspects of what I did when I was 
called in because of my particular uh, knowledge, particularly as you've mentioned around vaccines where I had a role which I don't think in any way would be something that the GCSA would normally necessarily do. Um, and I think probably, no, not probably, definitely, I had more knowledge of some of the areas that were being discussed than a GCSA would have in day-to-day -day SAGE activities for this particular emergency. Uh, and looking forward, Sir Patrick, given, first of all, the, the, the profound effect um, that the pandemic had on this country, and also, as you've said, not, not the likelihood, but the certainty that there will be another pandemic in due course. Do, do you think it's right that the chief scientific advisor should continue to be selected as someone who may or may not have a medical background? Or do you think that, in fact, the person fulfilling that function ought to have some relevant expertise that would be useful when the next pandemic arrives? I, I don't think the GCSA role is set up primarily for pandemic preparedness. It's set up to provide science advice across government. The great crisis that all governments face for the next many decades is the climate challenge. And so it would be equally well argued that you could have somebody who has that expertise. So I think the GCSA should be appointed on their scientific knowledge and breadth and their ability to work across areas and there should be no expectation that a GCSA is necessarily expert in this area. Um, thank you. Um, just finally on this sort of introductory section, um, we haven't mentioned so far uh, Professor Whitty um, and if one thinks back to those three limbs of your function during that time, it's right, isn't it, that um, to a greater or lesser extent, you, you, you performed those functions jointly with him? Yes. I mean, there is a difference in that the chief medical officer role is clearly solely focused on matters of health and particularly has a remit for public health and is embedded in the Department of Health and Social Care. So it's a departmental role, very um, senior role, a rather older role, actually, than the GCSA role in terms of the government. And that has a, a, an overall accountability for that. And, and, of course, to some extent, is closer to policy questions as well as the medical advice that's given. Well, th this is a theme I wanted to explore briefly. And if we can look at paragraph 98, please, on page 34. Um, Again, picking it up about half the way down, um, you refer there to the, to the DHSE as being the lead government department for pandemic planning and operations. You, you, you say it would be inappropriate for you to become involved in operational delivery plans. And then you make the point that the CMO and one of the, his deputies were infectious diseases experts, epidemiologists, uh, and uh, you then refer to um, Professor Horby, who, who was chair of NerveTag, and so on. But more, more generally then, um, were there particular areas where Professor Whitty took, a, took, took the lead, as it were, between the two of you um, in responding to the pandemic? Well, can I first make the point that operational delivery is absolutely outside the scope of the GCSA role. It's a science advice role. It's not a policy or, op or, or operational role. Um, the CMO and many of the other experts uh, from DHSC, of course, took the lead in things in the department and were very much in the driving seat in the initial phase in January when this was a departmentally-led response. And at all times, the CMO, of course, would take the lead on clinical matters and matters relating to medicine, NHS, and other things which were outside my remit. And um, is deeply expert in this. I mean, he was, he was this, this was his expertise in academia and clinically. So when you say this, you mean? Pandemics and, and epidemiology and the spread of infections. That, that is his background. Yes. Um, well, let's turn then, if we may, to that early period. And by the way, he's very good. He's very good. Um, well, if he's watching, I'm sure he's, he's grateful for that. Um, January to March 2020, Sir Patrick. Um, I'd like to start, if I may, by looking at a, an email um, that Professor Woolhouse sent, and which the inquiry has seen before. Um, he didn't send it to you. He sent it to two people that you knew, Jeremy Farrer and um, 
uh, Neil Ferguson. And if we can look, please. Yes. So this is the. We see that the, an email sent on Saturday, January the 25th. Um, uh, he sends Jeremy and Neil, as he calls them, this email. We'll come to see, and I, I imagine you've, you've looked at this already, um, that, that part of their response, I think it was Neil Ferguson's response, is to say that he um, had been having a similar conversation with you. So that's why I ask you about this, even though you weren't, in fact, the recipient of the email. Um, and we see, um, do we not, um, Professor Woolhouse sketching out on the basis of some fairly broad brush analysis and, and some basic figures, his understanding of the coming pandemic. Uh, he refers in the second paragraph to two key numbers reported in the WHO statement, the R number be of two, the case fatality rate of 4%. Uh, he, he talks about making a reasonable guess at the generation time. And then he says, and we can see that um, in the paragraph two below, he talks about this being a, a rough calculation that his undergraduate class could work out with a pocket calculator, a ballpark estimate of half the people in the UK getting this infection over a year or so, a doubling of the gross mortality rate, and as he puts it, a completely overwhelmed health system. Uh, and then two paragraphs down, having asked the question, what's the right response? He adds his words, that's not a worst case, that's based on the central estimates published by the World Health Organization. So not, we, we asked him about this, not a scenario, but if you like, a prediction. And then if we look back one page, please, we can see, um, yes, at the very bottom of the page, we can see that Neil Ferguson responded um, by saying, fully agree, Jeremy and I were saying the same to Patrick Vallance and Chris Whitty last night. Um, do you remember that particular conversation or conversations with Jeremy Farrer and Neil Ferguson about that time dealing with this sort of analysis? I don't remember a specific conversation, but I had many conversations with both of them and others around that time. And it was very clear from the numbers that we'd already looked at in um, the first SAGE meeting we'd called that this had the potential to be really quite devastating and the numbers of potential deaths and infections was extremely high. So I don't think there's anything in here that's terribly surprising and it was indeed the case that we knew that if this got to the UK, if this spread around the world, that this would have a large effect. Um, I don't want to split hairs, Professor, but you've used the word potential there. Um, the point that Professor Woolhouse makes in his email is that it's not a scenario, it, it, it's, it's not a worst case, it's something that, I, again, I don't want to get into technical terms, but he seems to be creating, trying to convey the impression that it's more likely than just something which is a scenario or something which might happen. I mean, did that, um, is that sense something that you shared at the time or not? Well, I, I don't think at that stage this had escaped China in a sort of uncontrolled way. So the first question was, would it fully escape China in an uncontrolled way? The second thing is that we didn't really know on the uh, overall transmissibility as to whether this would be contained in the way that SARS and MERS had been contained at that stage. And so I don't think it was inevitable at that moment that this would spread. And you can see lots of opinions um, being expressed quite forcibly by people around then as to whether it would or wouldn't um, reach right away across the world. And WHO, I think at this stage, hadn't declared it as a public health emergency of international concern. It certainly hadn't declared it a pandemic. So I think if it escaped and if it continued to behave with the numbers he said, then yes, that's true. But we didn't know that at that stage. And I think you can see actually by um, people's behaviours and even senior scientists' behaviours over the next few weeks that not everyone was was behaving as though this was going to happen necessarily. Do you think they should have been? Well, I think um, it's very difficult to know whether this was going to be contained in China and elsewhere. And had it been, then it could have been shut down. And it wasn't. And it became... Um, spread much more easily than I think anyone had anticipated, much more easily than SARS and MERS, which were containable. And that's what was not known at the time. Wow. 
Let, let me move on. Um, I, I want to ask you some questions about this whole question of NHS capacity. Um, uh, as we know, and the inquiry has heard detailed evidence, um, the strategy which was adopted over this time, has, the mitigation strategy as it's been described, is um, a paragraph 204 of your statement, page 65, I think it is. Yes. So, picking it up at the bottom, um, you, you describe, and again, the inquiry has, has heard plenty of evidence about the policy to flatten the curve, which is shown in that graph that we can see further up the page. Uh, you say you understood this to be a continuation of the existing policy goal once containment was not possible. And if we can go over the page, please. Um, you, you, you say um, the graph shouldn't give rise to a false sense of pre precision. Um, and then this, no minister defined a cutoff point for the number of infections or deaths other than by reference to avoiding the NHS being overwhelmed. And two points to pick up on that. Firstly, an issue you raise at various points in your different statements is that there was, I think generally throughout the pandemic and certainly in this early stage, a lack of clear understanding on the part of the scientists of what the government policy was. Um, and to put it another way, the scientists lacked a baseline against which they could do their modelling and provide advice. Is that, is that, a, is that fair? Is that, a, is that something that you raise and which applies at this time? I think, um, in a sense, there were three broad possibilities. One, that the uh, disease could be contained and eliminated. Uh, the second, that the disease would run wild and not be controlled at all and people would make no effort to do anything. And the third was to try and control it in some way to minimise the impact. And we didn't know at that stage whether it was fully containable or not. But once it breaks out, and by the way, the breakout of containment domestically is dependent upon the infrastructure you have, so the test, trace, isolate infrastructure. But once... Once it breaks out, then my understanding from the beginning was the government did not want to do anything other than to make... It didn't want to let it run riot. It didn't think it could get to zero COVID, and therefore it was to control it and suppress the numbers in reference to the NHS being overwhelmed. That was the closest we got to sort of understanding the aims, coupled with, as, as, as you'll see later a desire from the government not to impose overburdensome restrictions on liberty. Yes. So my question is, on that first point, would and, and maybe this wasn't a, a moment where you might have wished for greater understanding of policy, but might you have wished for more detail from the government about precisely what they were prepared to accept or not accept in terms of mortality, or was it enough simply to be told, we just don't want the NHS to be overwhelmed? Well, I think it would have been helpful to have that. Uh, but I also think, and I think I say this in my witness statement, we asked that several times to try and define a number, and nobody would give that number. I do think that's a very difficult question to answer. So mathematically, it's rather helpful to have it. It's actually a difficult question to answer. But at the moment, what we had at this stage was NHS not being overrun. Yeah. And so moving from there, given that that was what you were being told... Um, do, do you think that enough was done during February uh, to understand what that meant uh, and what a, an NHS overwhelm would look like, what the numbers involved were? I think the numbers... Well, there was a lot done in terms of what needed to be... what the options were to reduce the spread. So quite early in February, work started on non-pharmaceutical interventions... Um, Neil Ferguson in particular drew up a lot of uh, modelling around that, what the different options were, and came up with um, a figure that others endorsed as well of needing to get a 75% reduction in contacts in order to try and really suppress this to the right level. So there was a lot of work done on the modelling. Uh, there was a lot of work done exposing those options into 
COBRA, including with the behavioural science input on that. And there was a discussion, which I think uh, um, Boris Johnson puts in his statement, where, which he had with the CMO at the end of February on lockdown options and what the implications of those would be. So I think there was a lot of evidence that there were things that needed to happen in order to achieve this aim of suppressing the curve. I'm not convinced that there was a very effective operational response to that. Um, a lot of work you've described on understanding the growth rate of the pandemic and different MPIs that might be used to suppress it. My question is, running alongside that, if the policy direction was Yes, you must suppress it, but the yeah, target right. is to keep it below the NHS. Was there enough work going on in parallel to understand what that cap actually meant? Uh, thank you. Sorry, I, I didn't answer that part. Uh, we had great difficulty. I mean, when I say we, the modellers, had great difficulty in getting clarity on the NHS numbers. What we did know was that the NHS runs at pretty much 100% capacity, which is quite unlike most other countries. So we knew that the NHS capacity was likely to be very full anyway. And trying to get precise numbers on ICU beds and um, occupancy of other types of high dependency beds was pretty difficult during February. Um, and I think it culminated in a meeting which um, I think I asked to be set up at the first day of March with the NHS modellers to try and see if we can resolve this logjam. Why was it so difficult to get the numbers? Let's just look, if we can, at, a, at an email exchange you had with Ben Warner. So this is 195863, please. Mr. O'Connor, um, you're coming back to what Sir Patrick meant by the operational response being not very effective? Uh, yes, I mean, I will, I think. Um, uh, this is an email exchange, Sir Patrick, late in February, the 27th of February, so a month or thereabouts after the email we saw with Professor Woolhouse, and well into the time, judging by your statement, that it was understood that NHS overwhelm was the, the policy aim, what you were supposed to be avoiding. And Ben Warner says to you, um, I mean, he's a little concerned the NHS didn't seem to know what they needed for their models, didn't seem to have started modelling. Uh, and then your response, uh, you've been pushing them this, on this for the last 10 days or so. Uh, I think they've now grasped it as a meeting planned for Monday. Uh, that, that they haven't defined their input variables well enough. Um, taking a step to one side, Sir Patrick, you've already mentioned issues such as NHS capacity. Did they re was it really a complicated modelling exercise that was needed, or was there simply a, a sort of basic mathematical exercise of how many beds have they got, at what point on our understanding of the pandemic, will they be overwhelmed? Is, is it that complicated? Well, in one sense, no, it's not that complicated. And in exercise Nimbus, which I think took place in the middle of February, the question of NHS capacity inevitably being overrun was discussed, and Simon Stevens, I think, has referred to that. So it was very clear that the um, projections, the worst-case scenario, would overrun the NHS. That was clear and discussed all the way through February. What... Um, is being asked for here is the point that, that, that the modellers needed better information to try and understand when that was going to occur and what the warning signs were. Because at all times during February, from a scientific point of view, and this goes right back to a comment that um, Sir Chris made in February, we wanted to try and understand the mechanisms to get R below 1, to, to make, a, make the pandemic shrink. The question then was... When do you trigger that? And how deeply do you trigger it in terms of the number of things you need to have? That's what, that's what we were trying to understand. And the modelers needed the precise details to be able to understand what that looked like. So this was not a, a, an academic exercise. It was important for them to understand. And, and we thought it should be relatively straightforward to get these numbers. It turned out, like a lot of data flow early in the pandemic, it wasn't easy to get these numbers. It, when we look at... I think you said there was a meeting in early March. And when we look at some of the data that was provided, the modelling from the NHS, if we can look at 146571, please. This is the 9th of March. And if we could just zoom in on those bottom two graphs, please. 
um, that the, the essence of it seems to be that there's a peak, this is the unmitigated peak, and that what someone has simply done is drawn a line relating to total NHS beds on the left and critical care surge beds on the right, and said, well, there you go, that's, that's the point of overwhelm. Um, and if, just for completeness, perhaps we better look at the next page, please. Um, a different graph there, that's the mitigated peak, the same lines are drawn. Um, it doesn't look um, at first blush as though that is an exercise that really needed to take weeks and weeks and weeks and we don't know what the variables are, we don't know what the inputs are. It looks like someone has just said, well, this is how many beds we've got, we'll draw that line on the graph. Well, that's fine for this and that, 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 was, that was not what the modellers were asking for. But this, this is absolutely understood and it was understood in Nimbus in mid-February that in a big peak, the NHS would become overwhelmed. What it doesn't tell you is at what stage you think you need to act in order to do something. That's what the modellers were trying to understand and why they needed more precision. But, I mean, on, on a basic level, anyone could see that with the if, if you had a huge wave of infections, it would cause this problem. The, the reason I'm asking, um, Sir Patrick, is that, as we know, and we'll come to this, um, when the uh, weekend of the, the 14th, 15th of March came around, uh, one of the reasons uh, why it was felt necessary to um, take sort of dramatic steps or change direction, depending on which way you look at it, was a new understanding that the NHS was going to be overwhelmed. And, and I suppose my question is, is that, was that part of the analysis something that could have been understood earlier if only more urgent steps had been taken in February to do this sort of analysis? Oh, I don't think there's any doubt if you look at the CRIPS in February that people understood the NHS could be overwhelmed. So I don't think that's a new understanding. I think the new understanding on the weekend of the uh, 14th and 15th of March was that we were much further ahead in the pandemic than we realised. And um, the numbers that came in that week showed that there were many more cases, it was far more widespread and was accelerating faster than anyone had expected. That's what triggered an urgent recognition that this was an imminent problem of the NHS collapsing, not something that was weeks away with the possibility of introducing measures at a more leisurely rate. So that weekend was an intense acceleration and, and indeed intensification of the measures that were required to stop this. Let me um, turn then and ask you some questions about that weekend. And um, by way of introduction, it's well understood that different people who were there seem to understand the events in perhaps a slightly different way. Some people regard it as being a time when uh, measures were fast forwarded or accelerated. Other people regard it as a, a change of direction. Um, but certainly, I think, do you agree uh, it, it was, on any view, a time when decisions were either made or started to be made that a, a suppression policy, a policy of trying to keep the pandemic, the R number, below one, needed to be introduced, whereas previously that point hadn't been reached. Is that fair? Uh, well, the plan right from early February was to keep R below one to stop it growing, but this was a recognition that this had to be really implemented very, very hard at that weekend in order to achieve that. So all of the measures needed to be put in place. Is, is that right, that the plan from the very start had been to stop the pandemic growing? We looked at those charts and we see a curve. I mean, flattening the curve is not the same as suppressing the virus, is it? I think ultimately it is. It's a question of how far you want to suppress it. So you could suppress down to zero, which was never the aim. You could suppress a little bit, but you couldn't do that if that was going to overwhelm the NHS. And so the question was how far you needed to suppress it and at what stage you needed to do that. And I, I do think the, the focus on trying to get that timing exactly right was incorrect. It was, a, it, was a, it was an error to think that you could be that precise. That's a really important lesson that came out of this. I'm afraid you need to go early. Yes, well, we'll come... We'll come to that, that, that um, idea of yours, which, which, you, which you repeat in your witness statement. Um, I, I want to ask you um, about a passage from Ben Warner's witness statement, please. Uh, 
So if we can look um, at paragraph 303, yes, we have it there on page 78. Um, it's, the final, it's the final sentence. Um, no, sorry, the, the, the final two sentences. Um, he says, changing from a mitigation strategy to suppression midway would have been the worst of all worlds. And then this, from early 2020, we should have developed alternative plans, for example, lockdowns, after seeing the actions in China, or at least after Northern Italy. So his reflection, and it's one which is shared by some others in number 10 who we've heard from, is that the events of that weekend, in hindsight, suggest that they, would, they had previously been on the wrong plan, uh, and that they should have been thinking about a different plan, a suppression plan, earlier. Is that your view? Do you think that is a valid criticism of the science or not? I'm not sure that he is criticising the science, actually. I think no. he's talking about the operational plan to deliver. So that the notion that you had to intervene, and there are multiple emails and charts and things that were presented at, at, at um, COBRA meetings as well, talking about the combination of NPIs that would be required to reduce the spread and to get R below one. The question was when and how much to do it. And this, unfortunately, wasn't mirrored by an operational readiness. So the bit that I think is missing is whether the operational development of plans to do that at short notice were as advanced as they should have been, and they weren't. Um, are you there talking about things like test and trace? Or? Well, it's test and trace for sure. We, we had a we had a, um, a an isolate. We had a, an inadequate um, um, scale of facility to do that through Public Health England, but also the plans for introducing the NPIs. Right. I think, given that they're described quite quite early on, there should have been an operational plan to have those ready to pull the trigger on as soon as they were needed. And what we see is it takes quite a long time to get those actually working and to get the process in place to do that. I think that is a sort of learnable lesson that you should start earlier. And I think um, I, I take the comment Andrew Parker, the previous head of MI5, has said very clearly that he heard the warnings that we were giving in early February and took actions in that organisation to do things. I'm not sure that that urgency of action was as consistent and as reliable as it should have been across Whitehall at that time. You, you've, you've focused your remarks very helpfully, very clearly on the operational, if you like, the, the implementation aspect of this. It may be that, that, that Mr Warner was also directing at least some criticism towards SAGE and saying that SAGE should have thought more about lockdowns and, and more severe, more stringent MPIs earlier. Um, as you say, it's ambiguous, but is that a fair criticism to make? Well, I think, I think if you look at it, we, we thought a lot about MPIs. There's lots of, lots of work on MPIs, lots of work on the notion that you had to have lots of MPIs, you had to use them together probably, that this was going to be behaviourally difficult. It was, uh, links to the behavioural science group to look at that. All of that was done through February. Where we were wrong, and I think it's very clear, is our belief that we understood when to do that. It wasn't that we hadn't said do it and that this is going to be needed. It was that we thought we could understand when to do it. The data that came in during the week leading up to the 14th and 15th showed clearly that we were much further ahead. It was much more likely to be needed urgently than anyone had realised. That's a data problem, but it was also, I think, a scientific problem in that you can't manage this with the precision that you think you can, and you therefore have to take different actions. Uh, I'm going to come back uh, to... The, ultimate, the decisions taken over that weekend briefly in a moment, but I'd like to take a step to one side before I do that and ask you some questions about your relationship with Professor Whitty at this time and the extent to which your views differed. Um, and if we can look, please, um, at uh, 214802. This is an extract from 
Jeremy Farrer's memoir, uh, one of those memoirs from scientists that you referred to, Sir Patrick, um, giving us an insight into events. Um, Sir Jeremy, of course, was a member of SAGE during this time, was he not? Yes, um, he was. And he describes, we see the second paragraph there, a, a friction, as he describes it, uh, between waiting and wading in. Uh, he says it led to a palpable tension between Patrick and Chris in the early weeks of 2020, particularly given the apparent absence of political leadership uh, in that period. Um, and he refers to the fact that Boris Johnson didn't attend the first COPA meetings, uh, as, we have, as we have seen. So it's, it, it's what he describes as, as a palpable tension between waiting and wading in. Uh, and there are some references, um, Sir Patrick, in your, in your notes, which would seem to support that um, suggestion. And if we can look, please, at um, 273901, this is the schedule. Um, and I just want to show you a few references, Sir Patrick. <coughs> so in January, you, you, perhaps we ought to say that you, you weren't, in fact, writing these notes contemporaneously for the first three months or so of the pandemic, where you, you wrote a Correct. sort of catch-up section um, in March or thereabouts, looking back to the early months. But relating to January 2020, you said, Chris thought would be contained. PM said his guts tell him it will be fine. Um, but then Chris Whitty at the end, more cautious than me. Uh, if we can go to page three, please. Uh, the last few letters, the last sentence or so, Chris Whitty worried about pulling the trigger too soon, cause harm, <coughs> introduced some stuff on behavioural fatigue, if you started too early. And then on page 582 of the schedule, there is a, an entry that you made much later on, but reflecting on, um, on, on, on the early events. So Feb we're now in February 21, um, but uh, so Chris talking after us about the inquiry, was lockdown too late in March? Could we have known? And then this, he was a delayer, of course. Um, so help us, um, Sir Patrick, w was, there, was there this tension or friction between the two of you about how quickly um, to proceed with NPIs in that first period? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> Chris Whitty is a public health specialist, and he was rightly, in my opinion, concerned about the adverse effects of the MPIs. He was concerned that there would be more than just a con uh, the issue of the direct cause of death from the virus, that there would be indirect causes of death due to effects on the NHS, that there would be indirect harms due to people isolating mental health, loneliness, issues of health that come from that procedure, and that there would be indirect long-term consequences due to the economic impacts creating poverty, which is a major driver of health. So he was definitely of the view that the treatment and the result of that treatment needed to be considered together, and that pulling the trigger to do things too early could lead to adverse consequences. And that, I think, is a totally appropriate worry from the chief medical officer and a legitimate public health concern throughout. And I didn't have exactly the same worry. I was more on the side of, we need to move on this. But I think that's partly why the two of us found it useful to work together. I mean, he would bring in views that were broad public health views, looking at the consequences of interventions as well as the direct consequence of the virus. And I think sometimes I would want to push and he might not, and sometimes he was right, and sometimes I think we should have gone earlier. This was an occasion when I think it's clear that we should have gone earlier. Let me go back then with that in mind to those meetings over that weekend of the 14th and 15th. We've, we've gone to them in some detail with other witnesses, and I'm not going to go through them in detail with you. But in summary, uh, what was it that you were arguing for during the course of those meetings, and, and what was your understanding of what was decided? 
Um, we got information on the 13th of March, which unambiguously showed that the pandemic was far more widespread and far bigger and moving faster than we had anticipated. And that came from a number of sources, including surveillance systems that we'd set up to look at people who had pneumonia, um, hospital-based surveillance, and um, some work coming in from the initial sporadic surveillance systems and NHS numbers. That was unambiguous and extremely worrying. Over that weekend, it became very clear that much more stringent measures would be needed to control this, and they needed to be introduced quickly. I made my views known about that, that that was uh, the view of the SAGE committee and the modellers, and it was my view that we were in a position now where we had to move quickly. Uh, that decision, I believe, was understood. Um, on the Sunday of that weekend, I was unambiguous in the meeting that much more stringent measures would be needed now. I think that's recorded in Imran Shafi's notebooks. And the following day, uh, when the Prime Minister announced that there would be voluntary measures to keep uh, people from making contacts, I also suggested on that day that London was so far ahead that it would be necessary to possibly lock down London. So th those were my views over that weekend. I think, frankly, on the, that weekend, an in-principle decision was taken that lockdown would be required. It then took several more days to work that into a full mandatory process. But whether it is mandatory or voluntary is a political issue, not a, not a scientific one. We know, and we've heard from others, that the term lockdown may not have been one that was in, in play then. But, but you have said that your view, in essence, was that that was what you were campaigning for at the weekend, and there was at least an understanding that that was where things were headed as early as that. Well, I wasn't campaigning. I was trying to point out what the evidence was and how I interpreted it and what Sage thought. And Neil Ferguson's work and others' work during February had shown that in order to really get this down to the levels that you would need to be reduced by, you needed to reduce contacts by 75%. That is a huge reduction. It requires all sorts of interventions I'm not even sure we ever really achieved much more than 75% at the peak of the interventions. And that's what I was arguing for on that weekend, that if we wanted to now stop this from becoming devastating, we needed that degree of reduction of contacts. Now, th there are various references in the documents in your witness statement to the reaction of some of those who were at those meetings to what you were saying. Um, you refer in, in, in places to people being incandescent and you also refer to yourself having been reprimanded for um, advancing those views. Um, who was it that reprimanded you? Well, I, I, I got a message back that um, uh, Chris Wormold, the Permanent Secretary at DHSC, was incandescent with rage, as was the uh, Cabinet Secretary, about the fact I'd said this during the meeting on the... Sunday, I subsequently spoke to Chris Wormold and, and asked him why he thought that was something to be incandescent about. And he said it was the manner of raising it in the meeting rather than the substance that he was concerned about. And that I'd sort of thrown it into a ministerial meeting, um, whereas it should have gone through more due process. But I stand by the fact I think it was the right thing to say at the time. Um, that, was the, that was the reprimand as well then, was it, for, for, for the, the manner in which you raised it? Yes, I was told that I hadn't done things the right way and it was inappropriate for me to have raised that. And I subsequently, on the Monday, when I suggested that London um, was so far advanced, and it's worth remembering, actually, that in terms of timing of this, London was quite a long way ahead of other parts of the country. So although it, we had seeded the infection right the way across the country, other bits, you could argue, went into NPIs really quite early certainly earlier than other, other countries when you look at where it was. London, though, looked like it needed more. And I made that point in that meeting. It was discussed. There was a very clear rejection of that proposal. And uh, certainly, uh, I don't think the Chancellor looked terribly pleased at that moment. Why not? Well, quite rightly, he's concerned about the economy. And um, it, London was very much the engine of the economy. And that was a massive, massive decision to take.
when we, we may come back to that, but just last question on the, on the reprimand. There, there is one of the documents uh, amongst um, the disclosure which suggests that um, Sir Chris Whitty was one of those who, who reprimanded you on this occasion. No, no, Chris was the messenger. Right. He did not, he did not reprimand he, me. He didn't, uh, have, done he didn't have skin in the game. No. Um, I want to move on, and the last set of questions on this particular issue is about the timing of the lockdown. Um, you, as I understand it in your statement, say that you think the lockdown, this first lockdown was imposed a week too late. Uh, and I think you're referring there to the delay, as you would put it, from that weekend when the discussions we've just been uh, covering were had and that the, 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 the mandatory lockdown which was introduced a week later. And the, the word you use is implementation, so a delay in Im implementing the decision. First of all, is that a, a fair summary of, of your witness statement? Yes, I think that's probably the earliest at which that decision could have been made, maybe a few days earlier if we'd got the information. I remember at the time Neil Ferguson wrote that we were taking actions earlier than other European countries relative to where we were in the pandemic. But I think that weekend was, in principle, a decision that all of these measures would be needed. And I think it would have been sensible to have got on and done those as quickly as possible. But, you know, I'm not an expert in how you implement these things, how you operationalise them, what the legal requirements are. And there were some very significant legal requirements around that. And that took another week or, or 10 days for that to be in place. So that, those are the operational implementation type matters, which, in fact, we touched on when we were discussing Mr Warner's evidence. Um, but what I want to press you on then is the period before that. Um, bearing in mind what was understood about NHS overwhelm, bearing in mind the modelling and so on, do you think that that set of decisions, that understanding that was reached on that weekend, could or should have been reached earlier? Well, I, I've just said I think it could have been a few days earlier. Uh, I think it's it's difficult to know, if you look at the numbers of cases and the numbers of people who, even by then, were beginning to show how serious this disease could be, the measures themselves are not neutral. They're harmful. And so the question is around timing. It's around when you're prepared to take an intervention accepting that you're about to cause definite harm, because we knew the interventions would cause harm. We didn't know exactly how many of them would be needed to stop the spread of the disease. I think it's difficult, and I think other witnesses have said this, I think it's difficult to conceive that that would have been much before that weekend. I mean, maybe a, a few days, but we would have required very different systems. And it's worth actually doing the thought experiment and to to move to September, when we did know what the consequences of this virus was. We did know that the measures to restrict contact worked, and we did know that you had to move early. And the number of infections and deaths at every stage for subsequent decisions were orders of magnitude, in some cases, higher than at that period in March. So I think in retrospect, you know, the March decision was earlier than some of the later decisions, even with the knowledge that came with that. So I think, I think it's difficult to conceive that that, that, that decision would have been made much before the, that weekend, as I say, possibly a few days. Um, we certainly will be coming on to talk about later in the year and, and September and the second lockdown and so on. But before we leave this, the, the premise of my question so far has been that there was going to be a lockdown in March or thereabouts. It's just a question of when it happened and could it have been um, imposed earlier. Um, adopting the same hindsight approach, do, do you think that, in fact, that first lockdown might have been avoided altogether um, had, other th had things been done differently? I think that if we'd had a scaled 
test, trace and isolate system in place, you stand a better chance of keeping this under control. I think that in that situation, even a short type of lockdown, without defining exactly what's in that, but MPIs to try and reduce it, could have brought things down and then kept it under control with test and trace. But the reality was we didn't have tests at scale. We didn't have a test and trace and isolate system at scale. And we were unable, or PHE and the, and the organisation seemed unable to be able to operate that. And that would have required a lot more planning over previous years than had occurred. I, even with that, because we got seeded so widely across the UK, not from China, not from the countries where people thought this would come from, but from Europe, with huge importations, and we can see this in the genomics. Is this, this is half term? This is half term. And we had a huge influx from Spain, France and Italy over that half term and beyond, which meant that we probably had lost control. And test, trace and isolate only works at low levels of prevalence and a high level of ca capacity in the system. So, sorry, that's a long answer, but I think with everything that we had in place or didn't have in place at the time, I'm afraid that the sort of ultimate option of trying to lock things down probably was the only route open at that time. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Sir Patrick, well, is that convenient? Yes, just before we break, Sir Patrick, um, as you know, we take breaks for everyone just to um, take the opportunity to take a breather. Um, when you had this so-called reprimand, you said it was um, the permanent secretary of the DHSC, Chris, uh, Christopher Wormwood, and um, the cabinet secretary. Were they really more concerned about the process aspect of what you were saying than the substance, which was basically the dam has burst? That's what that's what they said to me after when I spoke to Chris Wormold about it and, and said, I hear you very cross with me for, for what I said. His response was, uh, there are ways of doing this that we need to do to make sure it's structured and ordered and it goes with a proper process rather than the fact that I'd said it as a um, statement. And um, we, well, we, 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 you, we agreed to differ a bit on that. But I, I mean, say, I, I won't ask you for your reaction to that. <laughs> very well. Um, a 15 minute break. <laughs> 
Mr O'Connor. Um, Sir Patrick, I, I want to, to move on and ask you um, some rather more general questions um, about different aspects of, uh, of the pandemic and, uh, and the response to it. Uh, and first, um, I, I'd like to ask you um, about the, the words following the science, the, the, the mantra, we'll see that other people's words, not mine, um, that we heard so much of, um, at least in the early stages of the pandemic. And I'd like um, to ask you to look at a section of the expert report that the inquiry received from uh, Alex Thomas, from, from, or latterly at any rate, from the Institute for Government. And pa paragraph 120 of that, please, on page 35. Um, um, and it's, a, as I say, paragraph 120, where we see his views on this issue. Uh, he says, there was a blurring of policy decisions and expert advice with ministers' mantra that they were, quotes, following the science, very damaging. The repeated assertion undermined the importance of ministerial judgment and the accountability of ministers for decisions. It made it harder for experts to set out their view, and the science implied that there was one single view, which was rarely the case. From the start, ministers and other government communicators should have been talking about being informed by, not led by, science. This is an issue that you touch on in your witness statement, but you don't perhaps go into it in slight as much detail as there. Do, do, do you agree with these sentiments? I, I do, and I, I didn't when it first happened. In other words, when, when it was first said we're following the science, my reaction was good, they're listening to us, because that's not always the case in government for the reasons I've laid out. But I think that the way in which this was both heard and possibly meant in terms of slavishly following the science, obeying it at all times, is completely wrong. I mean, you can't. And, and I can also totally agree there is no such thing as the science. I mean, science, by its definition, is a moving body of knowledge that tries to overturn things by testing the whole time. Um, so you say that it, when it was first used, you, you weren't um, opposed to it. Was it then something about the, the number of times, the repetition of it, or, or perhaps the, the, the circumstances in which it was used? I mean, at what point did it become a negative thing for you? Well, pretty quickly. I mean, initially I thought, good, they're listening to us and they want to hear the science. That is the right thing for them to do. But I think it became taken, both interpreted, I think, widely in the press and, again, possibly inside government as well, as a sort of direct following the science, a slavish following of it, which I agree, these are difficult ministerial decisions. They are precisely what needs to be taken by ministers to integrate the different forms of evidence and make those almost impossible judgment calls, which the science can't make and shouldn't make. Uh, did you um, speak to Boris Johnson or others asking them not to use that phrase? I can't remember whether we did. They, they knew that this was damaging at one point, and I think they did, it did sort of get softened to we're being informed by. And I think the Prime Minister at the time actually says that at some point, that we're being informed by the science quite early on in, in, in March or April. I can't remember when. In her witness statement, Helen McNamara um, made the observation in this context that you would never hear a politician saying that he or she was following the economics um, and drawing that distinction. Um, do, do you think that one of the um, reasons why this phrase may have been used was because the politicians didn't feel comfortable about their understanding of the science? And so, if you like, they, they, they said they were following the scientific advice in a way that, as Ms McNamara said, they would never say they were following economic advice. I think that is true. There's a, there's a great variability and largely an uncertainty and unfamiliarity with science in government. And my experience is that many people who haven't had a scientific training also view science as giving immutable facts. You know, they remember at school, they were taught a lot of facts about science. The truth is that science is a process. It's a way of testing what you currently know, experimentally or observationally, overturning hypotheses, advancing uh, 
and trying to increase your knowledge base. And it's a description of what you currently have, which can easily be overturned by new evidence. And I think that's not widely understood. I mean, understood may be the wrong word, but it's not intuitive to many people. And, and therefore, I think there was a bit of dependency that this was a scientific problem and people would listen slavishly to this and wanted to sort of slightly hide behind this um, at times. Just going down the page, uh, let's look at paragraph 122, please. Uh, a, a related but slightly separate point that uh, Mr Thomas makes. Um, he said that SAGE ended up filling a gap in government strategy and decision-making, which meant that government decisions were held off until the scientific advice was overwhelming, rather than using scientific inputs alongside other analysis to take decisions um, at the most appropriate time. Again, sentiments that you endorse? Um, I agree that we ended up filling gaps, and there are several examples where we did step into places that we thought just needed some attention, and we tried to provide that. Um, and there are several examples um, uh, in, in my statement. Um, I also think it's true that um, other inputs weren't as visible and weren't as obvious, and so there wasn't that overt ability to trade off between them. And I think I made this point about the economic analysis. I mean, it wasn't obvious where that was coming from, and it wasn't visible. And that led people to assume, therefore, the science was the decision-making force. So I think, I, I don't think I disagree with anything that's written in this statement. Yes. Well, and the, the point about economic input is one that we will, we will certainly come to in, in due course. Um, I'd like to move to a, a related subject, which is about the ability um, or the ease with which government ministers, civil servants, decision makers understood the advice that, that, that you were providing them with. Um, we've already touched on the point about uh, the, the, the proportion of fast stream applicants with STEM degrees. And of course, this, this question of, of um, uh, non-science graduates uh, struggling to understand scientific matters is, is a very old one. Um, in your um, witness statement, perhaps we can go to, to uh, page 207 of your witness statement, um, paragraph 642. You describe, if you like, your, your general experience of, of um, providing science advice to, to uh, decision makers. Um, and picking it up about four or five lines down, um, you say, I'm not in doubt that uh, the CMO, that's, that's of course Professor Whitty, and you gave advice from SAGE repeatedly, and that it, uh, together with the uncertainties, was usually understood by decision makers. However, it was often necessary to explain scientific concepts on many occasions. Uh, you say it's entirely appropriate for decision makers to, to challenge advice and so on. Um, then in the next paragraph you say you were asked a number of questions about whether the science advice that you provided to the Prime Minister and core decision makers was understood. You make the point that others will be better placed to answer that question and of course we can ask the Prime Minister and others. But you say again uh, that you, you took care to explain these concepts in a way that was comprehensible which was appropriate, and a couple of sentences on, some points had to be explained repeatedly, and some areas proved more difficult to get across than others. Uh, and just flicking onto the next page, you make the point that some concepts were particularly challenging, for example, absolute and relative risks in relation to comorbidities. Um, I, I just want to take you, um, Sir Patrick, to a few entries in your uh, notes which touch on this subject and try and get a feel for whether that is a, a general position and w whether those reflections apply particularly to the Prime Minister or, or whether in fact the position was, 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 was more marked with him. Um, so can we go please uh, in the schedule first of all to page 42. Uh, so this is an entry on the 4th of May and by this stage you are making the notes daily is that right? Yes. Um, you say, late afternoon meeting with the PM on schools. My God, this is complicated. Models will not provide the answer. PM is clearly bamboozled. And page 53, please. 
PM asking whether we've overdone it on the lethality of this disease. He swings between optimism and pessimism, and then this. PM still confused on different types of test. He holds it in his head for a session, and then it goes. Um, page 93, please. Watching PM get his head round stats is awful. He finds relative and absolute risk almost impossible to understand. Page 124. PM struggled with whole concept of doubling times, just couldn't get it. And then just two more, please. Page 167. Uh, this is from later in the year, September. Claire Gardner going through the PM graph, sorry, talked PM through the graphs. It's difficult. He asked questions like, which line is the dark red one? Is he colour blind? Then, so you think positivity has gone up overnight? Oh, oh. Then, oh God, bloody hell. But it's all the same stuff he was shown six hours ago. And then, finally, 389. This is now going forward to 2021. PM dashboard. Is that a reference to a meeting, dashboard meeting, yes. taken through the graphs, real struggle to get him to understand them? Um, so the, the question then, Sir Patrick, is those, that, that, those, those paragraphs of your statement that we looked at, yes, you talk about sometimes needing to repeat things and needing to explain things in detail. Help us and tell us if this, this is an example of passages that you... That you um, no longer want to support, but the message that we get from these repeated entries appears to describe something, at least as far as the Prime Minister is concerned, more serious, uh, a repeated failure to understand graphs, uh, scientific concepts and so on, forgetting things that he'd been, had been explained to him only a few hours earlier repeatedly. Was there a more serious problem with him than that which you describe in the witness statement? Well, I, I think I'm right in saying that the Prime Minister at the time gave up science when he was 15. And I think he'd be the first to admit it wasn't his forte and that he did struggle with some of the concepts and we did need to repeat them often. I, I would also say that a meeting that sticks in my mind was with fellow science advisers from across Europe when one of them, and I won't say which country, uh, declared that the leader of that country had enormous problems with exponential curves and the entire phone call burst into laughter because it was true in every country. So I do not think that there was necessarily a unique inability to grasp some of these concepts with the Prime Minister at the time, but it was hard work sometimes to try and make sure that he had understood what a particular graph or piece of data was saying. Um, and I'd learned from a number of uh, meetings, including around climate, where there were certain things that would catch his eye and would work for him and other things that wouldn't work for him. So there were ways of presenting the data that allowed him to get better access than others. It, Mr Johnson, it hardly needs saying, was the man who was making decisions that had incredibly broad impacts on the whole country. And it was critical, was it not, that he did understand the advice that he was being given? Yes. We've been talking so far about the need to repeat advice sometimes or to, as you say, use particular techniques or tags to help him understand matters. Um, was it ever the case that you had the impression that despite repeating things or despite explaining things in a particular way, he, he actually had completely misunderstood some of the advice that you'd given him? It's possible, but um, I think... W certainly when I left a meeting, I would, be con I, I would usually be persuaded that we had got him to understand what it was we were trying to say. But, but as one of the extracts showed that you, 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 you put up there, that six hours later he might not have remembered what was, what was in that presentation. So I can't be sure that he kept it in his mind all the time as he was going into whatever the subsequent meetings were that, that, that designed policy. I would also say that I think, and I, I don't know, you obviously have to ask him, but I think he does have a technique of almost deliberately going to sort of a misunderstanding just to check that 
that um, somebody is in a different position, and that was something he would use from time to time. But I think there was a problem in, 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 in scientific understanding, and it's not unusual amongst leaders in, in Western democracies. I just and, and he wouldn't be the only person who struggles with graphs, I no. confess to struggling with graphs myself on occasion. Let me just show you a couple more entries, Sir Patrick, just to try and gauge the, the, the issue here. Um, first of all, can we look at page 163, please? Um, so uh, we're in September 2020 now. There's a reference to the Chief Constable saying the rules are too complex. That, that's the subject of different evidence we've heard. But then this PM looking glum. Then suddenly, and I take it this is a quote from him, is the whole thing a mirage? The curves just follow a natural pattern despite what you do. Incredulity in the room. The whole meeting carefully manages the PM. Is it always like this? Is that an example, perhaps, of him just being provocative? Or, 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 or did that demonstrate just a fundamental misunderstanding? It was a point that he raised on several occasions. And he would look at the uh, peaks of waves of infection and ask, are the interventions we're making doing that, or is this what would have happened anyway? And he did come back to that point often, and we talked him through what the evidence was that the interventions had made the difference. And, of course, it is true that at some point the peak will come down because at some point public behaviour changes, the number of susceptible people changes, the amount of immunity in the population changes. So they do go up and down, but the point was that clearly these were being manipulated down by interventions. Mm. Just before we leave this entry, you see the last sentence there, a note that we're now in September. CMO still keeps offering a slightly slower path. Um, we talked already about the, the caution that Sir Chris uh, had in, in March. It looks as though you're recording a similar issue in, in, later in the year. W was it something that continued? Well, I think the, the point in brackets is important. I think this is wrong and said it. And, uh, and Chris and I discuss this sort of thing often. I still think that he, as the chief medical officer with a public health accountability, was right to raise the problems associated with the measures being taken. And that appropriate caution, I think, was useful and it was very helpful for the two of us to be able to discuss that and understand why we were in positions of either greater or, or, or slower pace on some of these things. I think it's appropriate. Um, one more of these references, please. Well, page 190. Um, so we're, we're, it's very much the same time, September of 2020. You record that the Prime Minister had come back from the, the Battle of Britain Memorial Service, was distressed by seeing everyone in masks, and then this starts challenging numbers and questioning whether they really translate into deaths. Sorry, into deaths. Um, says it's not exponential, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Looked broken, head in hands a lot. Is it because of the great libertarian nation we are that it spreads so much? Maybe we're licked as a species. We're too shit to get our act together. He doesn't seem to have been the easiest of decision makers to, for you to provide scientific advice to, Sir Patrick. It was difficult at times, and um, this is a, an example of where I suspect in this meeting I would not have tried to get across too many scientific concepts. would have waited for a better opportunity to do so and to have spoken to some others. As you, you mentioned at the outset, you, you had worked with other decision makers, Mrs May, um, was this reception of scientific advice that you were providing something you were used to, or was it out of your experience? Well, uh, he, um, uh, Boris Johnson, and uh, Dominic Cummings were extremely keen to get scientific advice. So they had, a, I would say, a disproportionate interest in getting science advice, but... Um, as you can see, it wasn't always easy to provide it in a way that was understood and actionable uh, by the Prime Minister. And I don't think, I mean, I doubt that the sorts of things described in here are terribly surprising to most people. Um, just before we leave this, I, I want to add in one extra factor, which is, of course, we know the Prime Minister was unwell 
uh, for some period, um, sort of March, April time in, um, in 2020, that the extracts I've shown you do have some in that period, but as we've seen also later. Is that a factor that we need to bear in mind with all this? I think he was, there was a period, and I, I, I described that when I think he was really unwell and was unable to uh, concentrate on things. When he came back, uh, he eased himself back into uh, things over a few weeks, and thereafter, I think there was no obvious change between him and what he was like beforehand. Yeah. Right, thank you. Um, I'd like to move on to, to a separate subject, please, and that is, uh, in the first instance, about... Uh, Spy B, um, the behavioural science subgroup of SAGE. Um, and it, perhaps we can start by looking at the SAGE minutes which record the decision to set up that group. Um, it, as we can see, it was um, SAGE 7 on the 13th of February. Um, if we go over to the next page, we can see uh, that you were there. Don't know. Did, did you, in fact, attend every SAGE min, uh, meeting during this period? I think I missed one. All right. Not this one. Not this one. Um, and if we go on to page four, please, uh, we see the section of the minutes headed behavioural science. And th this was a summary, was it not, of the discussions uh, which led to the decision that a, that a behavioural science subgroup would, would be uh, a good idea and then... We, 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 we've heard from Professor Rubin the, the way in which it was set up. Um, I, I wanted to draw your attention to one feature of these paragraphs without reading them all out, which is that there is a repeated reference within them uh, to messaging. Do you see that? Um, I haven't actually counted, but, but most of these paragraphs refer to importance of messaging and, and the link um, with behavioural science. Um, is it a fair uh, understanding, then, of these paragraphs that part of the purpose um, of setting up SPY B was to assist with um, the, the exercise of um, providing the public with appropriate messaging during the pandemic? Uh, part of the reason for having behavioural scientists there, and by the way, I think James Rubin and, and, and Brooke Rogers, who are at this meeting, absolutely exceptional, um, was to make sure that the principles underlying messaging were understood. So it wasn't to design the messaging, it was to make sure that principles like a collective uh, um, ownership of things was important. Like, don't drive fear as the messaging vehicle. And, and those sorts of things were important messages um, and Spy B produced some really important papers on that. It's because of that that around this time, I introduced um, James Rubin and Brooke to both Dominic Cummings and to Alex Aitken, who was the head of government communications, to make sure that there was a vehicle for them to feed in their... Um, principles of messaging. Yes. This is really what I wanted to explore, um, Sir Patrick, because on the one hand, as we've said, we see uh, great emphasis being placed on messaging. Um, on the other hand, um, we asked Professor Rubin about the fact that the, the forerunner to Spy B, which had been set up during the swine flu pandemic, was called Spy B and C, the C standing for communications. Um, and I asked him whether the lack of a C this time round was accidental. He said no. It, there was a deliberate decision taken that we weren't to be involved in communications. Um, and it's fair to say, isn't it, that there is a, if you like, an inconsistency there to have on the one hand a committee which was at least one of its main purposes to be involved with developing messaging and on the other hand to be told, but you're not having anything to do with communications. Is that a fair point? Um, I'm not sure it is, actually, because the, the, the point that the behavioural scientists are trying to give is the principles behind messaging, not the actual construct of the communications. And I think that distinction is quite important. This is behavioural science advice into communications and messaging, beyond communications, messaging more generally. Those 
that link's an important one. And I think um, the ownership, though, of the actual communications had to be within Public Health England, within um, the public health system, within government communications. And where SPIB could help was making sure that the principles were clear and, indeed, on occasions, I think they were brought in to help with specific... Uh, specific messaging as well as individuals, but I don't think it, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think it would be appropriate to have um, an academic group designing government communications. Well, um, I don't want to overstate this. Of course, one can see that in principle, providing the academic uh, sort of direction is one thing and designing the, the communications themselves is a different thing. But the evidence we heard from Professor Rubin and also Professor Yardley was that how it worked out uh, was that, yes, they did the behavioural science work, but they couldn't see that being taken into account at all in the communications uh, strategies. And, in fact, they disagreed sometimes quite strongly with, with, with several of the, the main strategies that were rolled out. And I think when we, when we spoke to Lee Kane, he said, well, I really paid more attention to my focus groups than what the behavioural scientists were telling me. So... Perhaps in principle, the division you describe is sustainable, but in practice, it, it didn't work, did it? Well, I think it's exactly the same as science advice and ministerial decision-making. So we, I think SPIB gave very good advice on this. We introduced them to Alex Aitken, to Dominic Cummings, others. The fact that the government then chose to do things that were different from that provided they've understood that the input has come, provided they've heard it properly, that is a ministerial decision to do things differently. I mean, I happen to think that they could have listened more to Spybee on this, for sure, and that would have been helpful. But it seems to me that's exactly where ministerial accountability comes in in decision-making. It's the same for this area of science as other areas of science. And it, uh, you know, maybe to put it uh, even more um, boldly... Uh, following the behavioural science would have been as bad as following the science. Are there, though, lessons to be learned for next time? I'm accepting your point that ultimately it's for politicians and their, their teams to either accept or reject advice they're given. It can't, it can't have been... Um, it can't be regarded as a positive, can it, that, that the evidence we have heard is that one had a, a group of behavioural scientists yeah. suggesting one thing and a group of communications people in number 10 essentially ignoring them and getting on and doing their own thing. I mean, that can't be regarded as, as having been a successful outcome. No. Are there lessons to be learned for next time? I, th I think there are lessons to be learned. One of the lessons which is important is to get the advice and the papers out quickly in the public domain because then it's very obvious when ministerial decisions are deviating from that advice. Ideally, you'd like to know what other advice they'd received that meant that they'd gone down a different route. And you said that Lee Kane suggested it was focus group advice that he wanted to pay attention to. Again, that seems to me to be a decision that is one that the ministers and their um, officials can follow. But I agree with you that the advice from behavioural science needs to be prominent, clear and accessible to everybody and it wasn't a good outcome that, that, that this was that some of these things were ignored um, let me let me move on and in fact pick up that theme you, you the one of the solutions or the solution you have suggested is transparency which which echoes an approach you took with sage which we'll we'll come to um, <coughs> but it may be that that some of the documents suggest that precisely one of the problems with spybe and, and perhaps more broadly, was with scientists expressing their views publicly. Um, and if we look, for example, um, at back at the schedule of your notes on page 50, you, you say <coughs> we're in March, sorry, May 2020. Spybe had to calm them down about the role of advice versus decisions. So that, to that extent, clearly a, a division you've, you've already explained. Immediately after another article in The Guardian with quotes from people and spy be disgraceful. So if part of the solution you're suggesting is that spy B's views should be made public, why was it disgraceful that they were doing that? 
this wasn't a spy B, it was individuals in spy B. And one of the problems that I think did occur was a very, very small number of people, one, two or three, uh, made policy judgments very visible in the press and statements on existing and planned policy, including on occasions, even discussions that have taken place in Spy B in the press, that had the effect of undermining Spy B. And it undermined trust in Spy B from within government. And my understanding from discussions with James Rubin and Brooke was that it also undermined the way that Spy B worked sometimes, because people were concerned about expressing their views for fear that that was then going to appear in a newspaper. So I think there was, and this is my, my, my personal judgment, there was too much policy, too much commentary on things that even weren't behavioral science sometimes on other aspects, and too many individuals who didn't distinguish between them as an individual and them as spy B and sage. And by the way, they might have done that themselves, but it was not how it was ultimately portrayed. And I think it's very difficult to run a government advisory committee if things are perpetually being uh, discussed in the press. Can I ask you um, about a different document, but it touches on the same issue, but this time in relation to sage itself rather than spy B. So this is 232074, please. Um, so this is, if we have the bottom half, um, this is a, a Treasury email uh, which summarises a, a, a SAGE meeting. It's a readout. And we see the first bullet point there. Um, I should, we, we, we don't need to go back, but we can see that the date was April 2020. It says, Valen started the meeting by highlighting he'd seen several reports in the media of SAGE members commenting on the science behind the government's approach. He highlighted that this wasn't helpful and said that no one should be speaking to the media. Again, of course scientists um, were independent, and in that sense they had a right to speak to the media, but was this something, to go back to your point about Spy B, which increases transparency and, and makes it easier for the government to be held to account? Or, as you're suggesting here, was it something that undermined the advice function itself and therefore ought to be discouraged or even prohibited? Well, well, I'm going to take issue with the minute because the chair's brief and indeed the repeated uh, commentary that I made at SAGE was any of you can speak to your own topic, your own expertise in the press and should feel free to do so. So actually we had a very open policy to people speaking to the press about their own areas of expertise. We asked that people didn't comment on policy because that then would confound the SAGE remit with their policy views. And we asked that they tried not to stray into areas that were not their area of expertise because that inevitably would reflect back on SAGE. And we asked that they didn't report the discussions that were taking place in the meetings because the minutes wouldn't have come out by that stage. So that that's what the restriction was, it was absolutely not that people couldn't speak to the media. And if you ask um, Fiona Fox from the Science Media Centre, she would say there's been more scientists from government committees out speaking about their expertise and trying to help the media understand in this pandemic than we've ever seen before. So I think we actually actively encouraged where it was appropriate for people to go and speak about their own areas of expertise, but not policy. So I think you're telling us that that is a, not an accurate summary of, of what you would have said. Um, yes. There's more nuance to it than yes. that, and that's what you've just given us. Yes. With that nuance, is it your reflection that that was the best, uh, the be the best way of dealing with this issue of how, how scientists should speak publicly without being able to stop them completely? Well, I don't know if it was the best. I mean, there may be better ways of doing it. Um, I did know that it was very, very difficult when scientists spoke about policy and other areas because it then undermined trust in the committees, and we saw that later in the pandemic with some departments and some ministers saying, I won't bring something to SAGE because it's just going to leak and people will talk about it. And I know that, um, again, the 
Science Media Centre felt that we got it about right. So I'm not sure what more could be done here. I definitely believe that people should be free to speak about their own areas. And I also believe that it's very difficult for a government committee to operate if people are apparently reporting government advisory views in the press outside the formal mechanisms. It becomes really difficult to build the trust that's required to get influence inside government. Um, uh, thank you. Let, let me just move, we're sticking with SPY-B, but, but to a related issue, and that is not so much them commenting publicly, but, but several of them joining independent SAGE. Um, and for these purposes, perhaps we can look at a, some email exchanges between you and Stuart Wainwright. Um, first of all, can we please look at 197131? Um, and here, just excuse me a moment. Yes, so if we look towards the I think if we can go on to the next page, please. Yes, we see at the top there an email from Stuart Wainwright. It's an exchange at this point between him and James Rubin. Um, and you can see that, that they are discussing the fact that I think at that stage uh, a small number of members of Spy B had joined ISAGE, independent SAGE, that is. And Mr. Wainwright says it raises real issues of trust for policymakers in HMG in the ability to bring things to the committee as a, quotes, safe space. Do you see that? Um, uh, and then if we can uh, please uh, look at the email immediately before that, so perhaps back to the next page. Um, you can see Mr. Ru or Professor Rubin, rather, um, saying that DHSC will presumably want us to adopt nerve tag style membership arrangements and I think the appropriate, that's the appropriate time for a refreshed uh, term, set of terms of reference. And then just before I ask you about this, if we can look at a subsequent email, this time it did involve you, 196969. Um, we see an email two-thirds of the way down from you to Mr. Professor Rubin. James, the effect is that government departments are now becoming very wary of putting anything to spy B because of a risk of leaks or misuse. Uh, we should think about how to deal with it. It's bizarre behaviour. And it, just for context, by this stage, rather more members of spy B had joined independent stage. So a related problem, Sir Patrick, um, is what we see here, in effect, a, a chilling effect that um, HMG becomes less uh, willing to, to ask questions of SPY-B because, in this instance, of a concern about um, whether that, that information will simply be passed to independent SAGE. Yes, I think that is what was happening. Um, there were confidential papers that came to SPY-B and to SAGE, and um, it was important that people who put those papers in knew that they weren't going to disappear somewhere else. And it was important that the outputs of those committees came to ministers with a chance for them to reflect upon them before it was widely articulated elsewhere. And I think there are, I mean, I'm second to none in my belief of academic freedom, but if you join a government committee, it's slightly odd to then be on a committee that's set up to challenge the government committee. It doesn't seem quite right to me. And I think um, Kamlesh Kunti, when he gave his evidence, was very good on this and said that um, um, independent age was very often focused on policy rather than science advice. And that seemed like quite a big worry that we'd end up with a sort of policy advice organisation with direct links to some of the papers that had come confidentially to spy B. So I was worried about it. And there are some examples where there was a chilling effect where people didn't want to bring things to either SAGE or to um, subcommittees as a result of either this or indeed the transparency of publishing all of our minutes and papers. Yes. And again, um, looking forward and thinking about how uh, 
as we stand now, some of these committees have been disbanded, some others are getting on with their work, but of course in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment which is completely different, there isn't the blaze of publicity. We don't hear scientists um, debating these issues uh, in the press all the time. But as you have said, there will be another pandemic, and we can imagine that similar circumstances might well arise. Um, what have we learned from this experience? Are there ways of controlling what scientists do? And there was a reference to the nerve tag arrangements. Are, are those different? And is that some, a, a blueprint for the future? Um, I, I don't know exactly what the nerve tag arrangements <coughs> were, but we've definitely, as part of the SAGE development programme, developed guidelines on what you should and shouldn't do in terms of speaking to the press, and it's the rules that I've just said, speak about your own area, please do, that's helpful to inform, but don't go outside that, and about membership of other organisations, that it needs to be declared up front, and there needs to be a discussion with the chair before it's agreed whether that's appropriate or inappropriate. The difficulty here was it just happened without anyone knowing about it, and then it became public, and it became very difficult to deal with. Thank you. Um, let, let me move on, although sticking with this theme of transparency, because as you've said, I mean, you, 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 you talk in your witness statement about sage transparency. Um, in particular, we know that at the outset of the pandemic, sage minutes, indeed attendees of sage, was not something that was published. And this was something that you took on yourself. And after a few months, that changed and minutes and lists of attendees were published. And you describe that step in a very positive way in your witness statement. Um, is this right? You regarded it as important, both as a reputational matter, but also, and I think this is the context in which you raised it with Spy B, as a means of providing challenge and uh, allowing people to understand whether the government had made appropriate decisions or not. Yes, I think we made the decision to publish minutes in March and then did the backlog catch up by May. Um, I do think, and this again has been put in the SAGE development plan, I think there should be a process for publishing minutes and papers as soon as is reasonable after the meeting with some caveats, and those caveats would be national security, one, and two, if there was a need to delay things for a little bit to give ministers a chance to be able to consider policy options in advance. But I believe both the uh, evidence for SAGE, but more widely, I believe, the scientific evidence that underpins advice to departments should be made public, because that's what science does best. It, puts things out there, other scientists can challenge, and that creates the right external environment to actually be helpful, not on the policy, but on the evidence base. And I think that is a valuable thing, and we had to go through quite a lot to make that happen during the pandemic, including operationally, it's quite difficult to get these things done because you've got to get permissions from the authors, you've got to get them in the right format, you've got to get them up on, on, on the website. And that took a little while in a team that was very busy doing other things. It's the sort of thing that um, we, I describe in, 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 in the so-called 100-day mission as getting the rules of the road sorted out in advance, so you're not trying to sort them out during a pandemic. One can see, and you've described very well, all the advantages that flow from this policy of transparency. Um, but there are problems that come with it, are there not? And one of them is the problem we've just been discussing in the context of SPY-B, which is a, a chilling effect. And if we look at um, your notes, um, well, I will ask you, but at least on, on, on the face of it, it seems that this policy of transparency did indeed create this type of chilling effect with SAGE itself during the pandemic. Um, if we can go, please, to the schedule um, and look at, uh, I think it's three references. Thank you. First of all, this one. We're in June 2020, um, and you, you write, uh, you refer to a paper from number 10. Uh, you say someone has completely rewritten it. They've just uh, cherry-picked, quite extraordinary. And then, for our purposes here, note apparently Simon Case um, I'm afraid I can't now remember whether at that point he had... No, he wasn't. He, he was a permanent secretary within the Cabinet Office at that point. He hadn't become the Cabinet Secretary. Simon Case said, don't bring new schools advice questions to SAGE. 
as the minutes get published. Um, if we can move on to page 102. Another note, Secretary of State um, for Education says, don't ask SAGE as minutes get published. Uh, and then moving forward a few months, both of those references were in June. If we can move forward to page 253, please, we're in October on a similar theme. Apparently the Cabinet Office, so not the Department for Education, but the Cabinet Office, now cautious about putting things to SAGE because we publish it all. That's a very bad outcome. Well, it, it is a bad outcome. Um, Sir Patrick, and I, I, I just want to ask for your reflections on what the, where the balance is. I mean, it's, it's up, for all the reasons you've given, there's a lot to be said for publishing the minutes. But on the other hand, if the consequence of publishing the minutes of an advisory body is that its customers don't come to it for advice anymore, yeah. um, isn't that something of a, of a, of a at least mixed situation? If I may just, on the very first one you, you read out about somebody rewriting the science, that was an internal paper in Cabinet Office, and that rewrite never went anywhere. Right. So, so that, that, that I you. think, is not. But this is a very important question, and there is no doubt that DfE took this view at times, and Cabinet Office, there was a, an alarm that that might happen. I don't think, in the end it stopped us doing anything on schools that we wanted to do, but it did mean we sometimes didn't get precise questions. I do think it's a problem, uh, and I don't know what the answer to it is, but I believe there is a cultural issue which can be overcome, which is the more the principle is accepted that the evidence is published, not the advice, not the policy position, but the evidence is published, the better government decision-making would be. And the more that happens during normal time, as well as during emergencies like this, the more it will become a culturally accepted and reasonable thing. There is a fear sometimes that if the evidence is out there, it's going to force a minister's hand. And as I said, I do think you need to give ministers time to do things before it becomes public. But my approach has been, and I've had this discussion during peacetime in government as well as during the pandemic, is the evidence itself can neither be harmful nor beneficial. It is just what it is. And provided all of the evidence is published, ministerial decision can be completely free to overturn that evidence and say, I choose to do something different. So it's a, it is a worry, and it was a concern, particularly during this period. But I don't think the answer is to reach for more redaction or more secrecy around this. I think it's to get into a normalised position where evidence publication is seen as the right route. Sir Patrick, you emphasise evidence in contrast to advice. But what we've seen in these extracts is a concern, in this case emanating from the Department for Education, about the SAGE minutes being published. Surely those minutes contain advice? The minutes usually are containing evidence and have it couched in terms of if the aim is to do X, then the following would be necessary. Or given the state of the pandemic at the moment, without a decrease, it's likely to lead to the following situations. It is usually not the case that it's giving direct advice on precisely what the science is suggesting a minister should do. Mr. Patrick, we don't, we don't want to split hairs about this, but thinking about the practical situation that, in this case, the Department for Education seemed to have been in, the thought process appears to be, we have this policy that we're considering. Why don't we ask SAGE about it? Um, one reason not to ask them about it is that if we do, their minutes will record their discussion and you can call it evidence if you like, but that anyone reading it will see, if this is the, 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 the view they took, that they think it's a bad idea. And that will mean that if we go ahead with it, people will criticise us. I mean, that's the problem, isn't it? It is the problem. And again, I think the more you focus on evidence rather than advice, the easier it is. It is a problem. I don't know what the answer to it is. My instinct is that greater transparency is helpful all round. And my experience from the pandemic was that, in the end, none of these 
came to be a problem. In other words, DfE did try and not bring things to SAGE. We overcame that, and they did in the end bring them, and we also did work on it. So they were... They were bumps in the road. They weren't blocks. And I think Stuart Wainwright laid these sort of pros and cons out very nicely in his evidence. Um, I would not wish to see less transparency of the uh, science evidence. Um, let me ask you briefly, if I can, about a similar but slightly different issue. Here we, we, we're discussing the question of whether SAGE were asked at all about issues. There's another issue which emerges from the notes where... Sage were asked, but their advice was either ignored or um, even apparently attempts made to change their advice. C can we look at some entries in your sh schedule, please? Um, first of all, page 56. So here we have your comment that we've been excluded uh, from the PM's strategy meeting. Uh, Chris, that's Chris Whitty, no doubt, is sure that it's because the Economic Secretariat in the Cabinet Office want to be able to present things about reopening without us contradicting them. So perhaps that's, in fact, a little like the other ones we were looking at. Uh, page 94, please. Um, two meter, the two-metre rule meeting made it abundantly clear that no one in number 10 or the Cabinet Office had really read or taken time to understand the science advice. Quite extraordinary. Page 98, please. Uh, number 10 pushing hard on releasing measures. They're pushing very hard, and then this, and want the science altered. We need to hold on to our hats. There will likely be a second peak. And then lastly, page 112. Um, in the economics meeting earlier in the day, they didn't realise CMO was there, and the Chancellor said, it's all about handling the scientists, not handling the virus. They then got flustered when he chipped in. So a collection of, of entries, all of them, to be clear, um, in terms of date, around sort of May, June, July, reopening in 2020. The common theme is that either SAGE is being ignored or it's not being asked or even a, a suggestion um, that the SAGE scientists should be handled in some way or that their advice should be altered. Um, help us, w was there a feeling, perhaps particularly at that time, that perhaps you weren't being asked for your advice in good faith? I think there were definitely periods when it was clear that the unwelcome advice we were giving was, as expected, not loved. And um, that meant we had to work doubly hard to make sure that the science, evidence and advice was being properly heard. Now, it doesn't surprise me that there were meetings that we were not included in. That's normal. We were, as I said, in, in number 10 probably for 45 minutes or an hour, and there were things going on all day and political decisions as well. So it's not surprising that we were not invited to things sometimes. Um, and there is, it definitely is the case that there were times when, because we were giving unpalatable evidence and advice people would rather not hear it. And I think that probably is a normal part of politics. And our job was to make sure that we weren't in the politics. We were continuing to make that advice as heard as we could make it. Did, did you, um, and this I now ask for your view on reflection, not writing your notes late at night, but did you feel uh, that you were in some way being manipulated or handled or that your advice was... People were asking you to change your advice? Well, I don't think anyone... Well, I know nobody actually got us to change our advice. I mean, um, uh, the example of somebody maybe putting pressure on us to do it, we wouldn't do. And I think there's, there's a WhatsApp exchange you've got where um, um, Matt Hancock asked me to change something, and I say, no, um, we're not going to change our advice because that's where the evidence bit comes in, that you've got to at least see that, even if you disagree with it and you don't want to do it. Um, uh, but I'm sure, I'm absolutely sure, because politicians are politicians, that, that there were attempts to uh, manage us and make sure that we were not um, 
always given the access that, that, that we might need. But I, I think overall, we actually managed to get through all of that and make sure that the advice and the evidence was heard. So I, I don't know what damage it did. And I, I'm not sure exactly what I'd recommend for the future on that, because it seems to me that's partly the nature of um, <coughs> the way the political system seems to operate. Uh, one thing we do know, and you state this in your, in your evidence, is that around this time and in the period just after it, there were a series of government initiatives uh, in respect to which SAGE was not asked to provide its advice. Uh, eat out to help out in the summer of 2020, tears, the rule of six, later in the year. I mean, do you know whether the, the type of thinking that's evidenced in these notes was, was part of the reason why you weren't asked about those matters? I, quite possibly. I don't know the reasons behind each of those. I mean, um, eat out to help out, we didn't know about until it was announced. Um, and uh, I think our advice would have been very clear on that. Um, I think the tiers, we were involved in some of the discussions as they started to say what they wanted to do, to try and advise on what would be sensible in different tiers if they were going to go down this route. But I don't think we were involved at the inception of that. And, and in some ways, nor should we be. These are policy choices, but we should at least see what the policy choice is and have a chance to comment on that. And it's one of the things that I say to chief scientific advisors in every department, you've got to make sure you're at the table for the policy discussion rather than waiting for somebody to come to you and say, I have a bit of science question that I've got for you. Just focusing for a moment on eat, eat out to help out, um, it's evident from your witness statement uh, that at the time uh, you and indeed SAGE uh, didn't agree uh, with that approach or at least were alive to, to, to the risks that it, that it brought with it? Would that be a better way of putting it? Well, I think up until that point, the message had been very clear, which is interaction between different households and people that you weren't living with in an enclosed environment with many others was a high-risk activity. That policy completely reversed it to saying, we will pay you to go into an environment with people from other households and mix in an indoor environment for periods extended over a couple of hours or more. And that is a completely opposite public health message as a result of that. Now, it's quite likely that had an effect on transmission. In fact, it's very difficult to see how it wouldn't have had an effect on transmission. And that would have been the advice that um, was given had we been asked beforehand. Yes. Well, let me just take you to your statement, if I may. It's paragraph 648, page 209. Um, it's uh, the last sentence or so. You say, as I've discussed, Sage, this is the point you've just made, was not asked to provide advice ahead of the Eat Out to Help Out scheme being introduced. And then you say this, but I think it would have been obvious to all involved that our advice would have been that this was likely to increase transmission of the virus. Um, we can hold that in mind. Um, can we look at a paragraph of, of uh, Mr Sunak's witness statement, please? Um, thank you. And it's, it's paragraph 317. Uh, and Mr Sunak says, throughout the period at which Eat Out to Help Out was in operation and immediately prior to its implementation, I don't recall any concerns about the scheme being expressed during ministerial discussions including those attended uh, by the CMO and uh, no doubt he means the GCSA. That's you. Um, th th there's a, a certain inconsistency between um, your statement where you say that you think that it would have been apparent to everyone that you opposed it and Mr Sunak's statement where he says that you never objected to it. Well, we didn't see it before it was announced. I think others in the Cabinet Office have also said they didn't see it before it was formulated as a policy. So we didn't, weren't involved in the run-up to it. And um, around that time, lots of measures were being released. And you'll see repeated references in various minutes and notes and emails. And indeed, I'm sure in my private notes, to our concern that people were piling on more and more things and that this would come to... Uh, drive R above one, and I think that was discussed at Cabinet as well, that that was the concern we had. Um, so I think it 
would have been very obvious to anyone that this was likely to cause an in well inevitably would cause an increase in transmission risk um, and I think that would have been known by ministers and Mr Sunak if he was in the meetings I, I can't recall which meetings he was in but I'd be very surprised if if any minister didn't understand that these openings carried risk yes thank you Ms. Patrick Maybe I'm about to move on to another topic. Yes. Certainly, Mr. Turner. Two o'clock, please. All rise.
Let's check on her. Uh, Sir Patrick, one of the uh, matters we touched on uh, this morning was the uh, question of um, the advice other than sage advice um, covering areas um, such as economics and um, societal issues and how that fed into um, policy makers um, both privately and publicly and um, I want to ask you some questions about that topic and um, I'd like to start by looking at another passage um, from Mr. from Ben Warner's witness statement um, something we asked him about a week or so ago when he gave evidence. And if we can look at paragraph 309 of his statement, please. Uh, he said this, I felt that the biggest absence throughout the pandemic was the lack of economic modelling in decision making. Uh, HMT, that's the Treasury um, responsible for economic modelling, has a strong set of policy officials, but when it came to my interactions for all aspects of my work in government, I found that HMT was severely limited when it came to specialists in science, advanced analytics, technology or data. So Mr Warner's view was that this was an important gap uh, in the larger picture. Uh, that may be um, very much the same point that you were making um, in one of your notes. Um, and if we can look please at the schedule, page 522. This is late, uh, this is an October 2021 entry um, where you say economic predictions, HMT saying economy nearly back to normal and plan B would cost 18 billion, no evidence, no transparency, pure dogma and wrong throughout. Now, Sir Patrick, that may be one of those comments which is towards the frustrated late at night end of the spectrum. Um, but am I right that um, essentially you're making the same point there as, as Mr. Warner was about the, the problems um, with economic advice feeding into decision making. Well, so I agree. That's probably the late night frustration comment. But I did think that there was a lack of transparency on the economic side. And it was difficult to know exactly what modelling had been done and what input there'd been to various assertions and comments made. And that made it very difficult. And of course, it wasn't publicly available either. And that created, I think, an imbalance where the science advice was there for everybody to see. The economic advice wasn't, and it wasn't obvious what it was based upon. And um, it therefore unduly weighted the science advice in the public mind, I think, and created a real problem in terms of how decisions could be made. I did try to suggest that um, a, an economic advice group similar to SAGE was set up, and indeed had one meeting where we brought people together, but it wasn't pursued. No. Well, I'm going to come to that in a moment and we'll look at some documents. But before we do that, I think what you're describing is, if you like, two different problems, albeit perhaps come from the same route. One is, which we can all see, there was an imbalance in terms of the public perception because, on the one hand, SAGE minutes were being published um, and certainly there was no similar exercise with anything to do with economic advice or modelling. So as you say, an imbalance there, and that led to the, the, the sort of public perception that you've described. But there's a second issue which I want to press you on, which is, well, was it just an imbalance publicly, or was there in fact a, a lack of or deficiency in the advice, the economic and other advice that decision makers were receiving? Well, I, I can't comment on what they were receiving because I don't know what they were receiving. That was part of the problem. There was definitely, in my opinion, a lack of um, seeing that, seeing that the basis for decisions and assertions made at meetings. So in a meeting where the question of rising numbers of, of infections was being discussed, there was very little that I saw that said that the economists had understood that rising infections alone were enough to cause problems for the economy and a lot of emphasis on why interventions were negative for the economy, and quite difficult for me to see what the workings were behind that and why that was the case. So I didn't see evidence of a very strong analytical basis, but then it may have been there. It, I just never saw it. I mean, when you talk about here, for example, no evidence, pure dogma, that does at least seem to suggest that you thought it wasn't there rather than you I, I just I did think it wasn't it. there. 
Um, and that, as you say, perhaps is why you, one of the reasons why you suggested an economic sage. Well, uh, yes, and I wasn't even necessarily suggesting an economic sage. I just thought an external economic body would be helpful. And certainly that was the representation I was getting from various rather eminent um, academic economists who felt that that would be helpful. Yeah. Well, let, then let's look, um, if we may, at an email, which is 235261, please. It's dated the 5th of June, 2020. Um, it's, in fact, an internal Treasury email from Claire Lombardelli to her colleagues at the Treasury. But it, it describes a meeting at which you were present, Sir Patrick. And I think, in fact, this may have been a meeting that um, you, you were convened or were instrumental in organising. Um, uh, we've asked um, Mr Warner about this email uh, as well. You refer in your witness statement to um, having convened a meeting. Do, do you think this was it? I wasn't sure reading this whether it was that meeting, but right. it was probably in or around this time. Um, in any event, um, we see um, Ms Lombardelli recording um, what had taken place at that meeting. We see it was at number 10 and chaired by Mr Warner, but I, I think we know, this is right, isn't it, that you were there. <coughs> Again, I wasn't quite clear from this whether I was at this meeting or not. Um, it refers to a follow-up with me. I certainly don't think Ben Warner would have been chairing the meeting that I organised. I think that, that was a separate meeting, probably, because I um, think it was chaired by um, yes. possibly Claire. Well, if it helps, if we look at the bottom of this page, um, we can see another email in the way these things often work, this one which seems to have been in the run-up to the meeting, and you are one of the, cop we see, government chief scientific advisor. OK, well, um, that, 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 that with Tim Besley and Nick Stern, I was involved with, for sure. So that, that was yeah. a, a preparatory step to the meeting, so it looks like perhaps you were there. In any event, um, let, let's not worry too much about that, because I want to ask you, a bit, you about the substance um, of Ms Lombardella's email. Um, so if we can go back up to that, please. Thank you. Um, she says, the discussions um, felt very familiar. Um, the economists all did a very clear pitch on smarter NPIs being able to deliver the same level of virus control at lower economic cost. And then this, there was a general conclusion by economists that the economics is not being considered enough and a desire for a place to bring this together and three options. Um, first, an economic sage. Secondly, a single model, and lastly, something more informal. Um, she then says, the economists obviously killed the single model. Just pausing there. We've heard some evidence uh, from members of SPY-M. In particular, I think it was Professor Keeling, um, but Professor Medley and Professor Woolhouse touched on this subject as well, about early steps that were taken during the pandemic to try and bring together economic and um, epidemiological modelling. Um, and certainly the flavour of their evidence was that this was something that should be pursued. Do you know why it would be that economists are uh, d d don't take kindly to this idea? And, and, and what's your view about whether this is something that should be um, pursued in the future? Uh, well, I'd like to deal with that in two parts, if I may. I think that there should be in the UK a an academic centre for pandemic preparedness. And I've put that in my witness statement. And I think such a centre should be very multidisciplinary. And in such a centre, I can absolutely imagine how economists, mathematical modellers, infection, social scientists could get together and work out whether there is a way of modelling this. And that would be a very important thing to try and do. So on that level, I agree it's worth exploring. On the question of whether there should be an economic sage, I think there's a very grave danger in having a group that tries to integrate the very thing that ultimately is a ministerial trade-off decision and one that is an important democratic area. So I, I would not be in favour of having an integrated single model for the reason that it then tends to put out the answer which it can't possibly do. And given what I know about the uncertainties in infectious disease mathematical modelling and the uncertainties in economic modelling, I suspect there would be one almighty uncertainty that came out at the end of it. So just to, to, to be clear, I think what you're saying is that as far as the modelling is concerned, that is something that 
should and could be pursued to see whether it's possible. Yeah. And certainly the evidence we heard from the modellers was that if that is to be pursued, then I think their phrase, it should be done between pandemics rather than during a pandemic. And that may be, take us back to the type of institution or academic body that you described. Um, switching focus to the SAGE idea, um, I think what you've said is that you are against the idea of, as it were, adding an economic strand to the existing SAGE. Is that, is yes. that your... Um, what about separately having a separate body similar to the existing SAGE, which, which is more focused or entirely focused on economics? which may have been the suggestion here. Which I, I think that sounds sensible, and it's one thing that I would support, but, and I want to be an important caveat here, you know, I'm not in Treasury, I don't really understand all the sources of advice they've got, and it may well be they've got similar advisory mechanisms going on. If so, I didn't see them. So I, on, on, the, on the face of it, I would be in favour of an economics sage type activity. Um, you are in favour now, and I think it was the case, you said in your statement, you were in favour... Yes. Two years ago or so, three years ago, when this was discussed at the time, um, the message in the email is that this is an option that was going to be taken forward. Um, we can see there it says it was agreed that Ben Warner would follow up with individuals, including you. Um, what, what did happen to this idea back in 2020? Were, were steps taken to try and establish an economic stage? If I remember correctly, I think Simon Case pulled together a meeting at my suggestion, which may have been following this one, with economists to try and see whether that would work, but there was no take-up afterwards. So I think there was a single, a single meeting and no follow-up. And I don't know what happened to this within Treasury. Uh, Claire Lombardelli would probably be the best person to answer that. You, you, in your witness statement, you say that your understanding was that the Treasury did not wish to pursue this idea. Well, that seemed to be the case. In the, I can take you to it if you like. I don't know if you've looked at it, but at a, a, an IFG report that was published recently puts the position slightly more strongly in that and said they understood that, eight, that the Treasury vetoed this proposal. Is that something that you can speak to? Or? I don't think I was aware that there was a veto. I mean, I, I, was, I was aware that nobody really wanted to do it, but um, I, don't, I, I don't know whether it got as far as a sort of concrete written proposal and somebody said no. I suppose one of the um, possible criticisms of this approach, which would involve setting up a, a new body, um, sitting alongside the existing SAGE, is that... One might then say, well, if we've got an economic sage and an epidemiological sage, why don't we have a sociological sage? Or and, and one one creates a, sort of too many advisory bodies. Is that something which you think would would have any force? I think I mean a lot of social science was included on sage and would be included on the economics um, sage as well, and. I certainly asked the British Academy to do a piece of work in, I think, June 2020, looking at the COVID decade, trying to understand all of the ramifications. So there are other ways to get that. So I think you're right. It is a risk that you end up with a sort of plethora of these things. But I think that one, and a science one, does seem like a sensible approach, provided Treasury want it and will make it work. Otherwise, it will be not effective. Yeah. Um, before we leave this subject, you, you mentioned the Academic Centre for Pandemic Preparedness a moment ago, and it's something you, you've referred to more than once in your witness statements. Is there anything else you want to say about that in terms of how you imagine it, it, what it would cover, what it would address, how it might be set up? Well, there are several universities that are, that are developing work for pandemic preparedness, and I think a single centre with a sort of hub-and-spoke model would work extremely well in the UK, and it could look at all the things that you would like to have looked at during normal times to make um, the input much more effective during a pandemic, and that could include everything from evaluating the effects of NPIs, which ones work, which ones didn't, how well do they work, what would you do differently, smart NPIs, um, different approaches to viral detection, surveillance systems, ways to understand pathogenesis of viruses. I mean, it should be a very broad activity. 
in my view, which should draw on existing groups rather than necessarily bring everyone into something which is only working on that, because you then have a huge amount of expertise brought into an area that's focusing on how one thinks about pandemics. And Oxford and Liverpool and others have suggested doing this, and I'm a strong supporter of the idea that this would be a useful thing. Would it involve government funding? Well, I think it should, and, and I think it should also involve... UKHSA, because um, uh, UKHSA is the body with the statutory responsibility for this area. And one of the things that I observed during this pandemic was that Public Health England didn't have the strong connections and science base that was needed. It had some very strong ones, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as robust as it should have been during that time, through no fault of their own. But, but there was inadequate funding and inadequate links to various academic groups. Good. Um, let me move on to uh, another subject, Patrick, although it's, it's related, which is a sort of structural, SAGE question of how the advice which is generated within SAGE and the subcommittees is communicated um, to, to ministers. Um, and there are perhaps two, two linked issues. One is by what means is that advice communicated? And the other is sort of to whom or to what body should it be communicated? And, and it may be that um, we need to bear in mind the distinction between, if you like, the typical short-term emergencies for which the COBRA system was designed on the one hand and the type of pandemic that we're addressing on the other. Because um, in that first category of case, um, I think um, we can see that the existing system worked well. Um, you have SAGE. It, can, it discusses um, issues that it's asked to discuss. It can produce a minute. And then the chair of SAGE, you or um, another, can convey that um, information in a fairly straightforward way to a COBRA meeting. Um, and both of those issues, therefore, that I mentioned are addressed. The difficulties, perhaps, come from the pressure that was put on that system by the much larger scale and the much longer duration um, of this pandemic. Um, before I go on, do you agree that, that those are the issues? Yes. Um, and so starting with the question of the means by which the advice is communicated. Um, several witnesses um, who've given evidence to the inquiry uh, have commented on the great pressure that was put on you um, and Professor Whitty um, as, as it were, the conduit for advice from SAGE um, to um, decision makers. Um, all of them, I hasten to add, uh, endorsed your uh, hard work and, and ability to, to undertake that task, but they said, uh, they have said, um, that um, both because of the enormous amount of work that was being done by SAGE and all of the subcommittees that were sort of corralled underneath it, and the duration, that in fact it was really an, an enormous task, perhaps too big a task, um, to expect the two of you to be that very narrow point of connection in terms of explaining and passing on that advice orally to decision makers. Um, what are your comments on that and, and should we be thinking of a different model for the future? I think you have to have a point of connection from SAGE, which is one or two people into the system. You have to build trust within Whitehall, you have to have trust within the Cabinet Office, you have to have it clear who people turn to, and similarly you need a docking point on the other side that's equally clear and able to receive the advice. I think on occasion it's useful to have a broader group. So we had various teach-ins that took place in Cabinet Office where we had up to sometimes 170 people coming to listen to things and hear more about them. That's useful. Um, I think we had at least one meeting where a number of dissenting scientists got together and spoke directly to the Prime Minister in a, in a small group. I have to say, I don't think he found that in the end particularly helpful, other than to realise that it was difficult to work out what to do with all these dissenting voices. So I think it's not practical or realistic to assume that you can have 
groups of scientists just pitching up to talk to the Prime Minister or to the Cabinet Secretary without some structure around it. I do think that we could have benefited from an occasional step back meeting, and um, this is something I did certainly during peacetime, where we bring in a few scientists to speak to the Prime Minister on a particular topic to give him, in that case, a chance to ask questions that perhaps he might not want to ask in a bigger group. I think that is something that's worth exploring a bit more, but I think it's not practical to assume that you could have a group of modellers going in to speak to the Prime Minister and getting a sort of sensible sort of interaction. Um, I, I wasn't really suggesting an alternative. I was asking if there was one, but I think your uh, broad answer is that the, more or less the system that, that existed at the time ought to carry on. But to, to just to press you on that, we've already noted that um, we as a, as a country were very lucky that the two individuals who were occupying the two posts of Chief Medical Officer and Government Chief Scientific Advisor were so well qualified uh, by their experience and training to deal with the pandemic. Um, if one imagines another pandemic where CMO and the GCSA are not specialists in epidemiology, pandemics, vaccines, pharmaceuticals, and so on, but, but come from completely different specialisms. Um, would that be an extra problem in those individuals bearing the weight of conveying sage advice to decision makers? I think the CMO will always be an expert in this area in some form or another. And, and the CMO will always have around him or her a group of people who really understand this, which is why the lead government department idea does have some importance to it. Um, so I don't, I don't have concerns there. I think it's highly likely that the GCSA wouldn't. Um, and that has advantages and disadvantages. What the GCSA would need to do would be to make sure that they had the right advice around them so that they could undertake that function but I suspect there would be more weight on the um, CM, more weight on the CMO's shoulders in that sort of situation and it may be that one of the deputy CMOs or one of the other people in that sphere would step up as well. Um, I focused up to now on the first part of the equation in terms of who, who, who's, what's the conduit from SAGE into the decision makers and I want to move on and ask you for the other end, which is you've referred to as the docking point, because it's right, I think we can see, that although at the start of the pandemic um, you were conventionally feeding into COBRA, once the COBRA meetings ceased to, take, to certainly to take place regularly, uh, you were then providing advice to a range of committees, whether it was COVID-S, to dashboard meetings, um, the, the, the COVID task force and so on. And do you think um, that there is a need to be clearer about your term, the docking point for SAGE advice? I do. Um, I think it was very clear when it was CCS, the Civil Contingency Secretariat for COBRA. It then became very unclear. It became clearer again when Simon Case came in to lead the COVID task force. It narrowed down to a more sensible uh, um system and that then improved quite a lot over time in terms of them being able to ask better questions as well and frame them more appropriately but I think there needs to be a system that swings into action immediately in the case of a pandemic that says here is a structure which will stay constant and it's properly populated with people who can both look at the operational needs that come out of that so they can coordinate that across Whitehall and have enough scientific understanding and data analysis understanding to be able to absorb the evidence <coughs> and understand the implications. And would that system be a, an expanded CCS or something completely different, do you think? It's, pro it's always easiest, I think, to build off things that are used routinely rather than to stand up something that is completely special for one event. And so I think building it from some expanded CCS which is then exercised regularly in other forms, but knowing that you're going to have to increase the scale of this and the duration of this very dramatically um, at the time of an event would probably work. In the SAGE system, we've 
in the Safe Development Plan come up with the idea of reservists who could be brought in, who'd, or, who'd always be sort of aware of what was going on, and they could quickly be brought in to expand capabilities, and it may be something like that would work as well inside the Cabinet Office. Thank you. Um, let me ask you briefly just about one other, uh, a, a rather discreet point, which is about press conferences. Um, can we look, please, at paragraph 743 of your witness statement, page 235? Um, we, of course, all, Sir Patrick, remember your appearance. I don't on... have anything on my screen. No, I'm sure if I'm supposed to. We, we, we have confidence that it's coming. There it is. Um, we, we all remember, Sir Patrick, the press conferences um, at which you and Sir Chris Whitty were regular, albeit not um, permanent, attenders. Um, in this paragraph of your witness statement, you say, we can see here, picking up the end of the second line and going on, this was not a role that you sought, but, but you were asked to do it, and you did. Um, The question I want to ask is whether, looking back over the whole run of, uh, of the couple of years when you undertook this task, um, you think that it was a role you were able to fulfil without blurring that line, or at least blurring it too much, between your independent role to give advice uh, and the government's role in setting policy and announcing it? I think it would be very helpful to have others doing it as well, and we said that at the time, so economists, um, people from the NHS, others to make sure that the operational side was properly covered. In terms of the blurred line, a lot's been written about this. People have strong views in both directions. My view is it was helpful for us to stand up and deliver the evidence as we saw it and the outputs from SAGE it was unhelpful when questions became overtly policy-driven and political, which is inevitable in a press conference. And that worked best when whichever minister we were with or the prime minister took those questions himself. But I think it did cause some people to say, well, it lends a sort of credibility to a policy that you might not agree with. All I can say is, yes, I think that is a risk, but there were occasions when we overtly at the podium disagreed on the evidence that was underlying, um, or at least ex explain the evidence that underlay a decision. So for example, in the move of the two meter rule to, to a lower figure, I was clear on the podium, two meters is safer than one meter, full stop. Doesn't mean that it's not unreasonable, it's, a, to, it's unreasonable to make a policy decision to move, but the evidence base was clear. So. I'm sorry, that's a rather long answer to your question because I don't know whether ultimately it's the right or the wrong thing for us to have been there. I think it's something worth looking at. Um, my gut feel is it was probably overall beneficial for us to be there. And one, one could, of course, imagine a, a recommendation that um, that simply shouldn't happen and that the risk of... Uh, independent advisors such as yourself becoming too associated with government policy was such that it, it was better for you not to take part in those sessions at all, but that would come at a cost. Yes, I think exactly. There's the risk on both sides, and I think marginally I'm in favour of saying, yes, that was beneficial, um, but I don't have an evidence base to back that, and there are clear risks associated with it that need to be recognised, and if somebody had said to me, don't worry, you don't need to come any more press conferences. I wouldn't have lost any sleep over it. Well, um, I may <coughs> come to ask you one or two more questions about press conferences before we're done, Sir Patrick. But one of the risks, too, presumably, is the risk of abuse about which Sir, Sir Christopher Whitty spoke during Module 1, the abuse that some of you and your colleagues suffered because you've been associated with the policy decisions. Yes. Uh, I think that's a risk that's going to occur anyway, and um, it was very real during this pandemic for a lot of us, and something that needs careful thinking about in the future. And yeah. and for certainly, some members in of Sage had that as well, even though they were somewhat distant from the direct association with politicians. Um, Sir Patrick, I want to move on and ask you some questions about 
events in the latter part of 2020. And, and to start with um, questions about the segmentation policy or, or suggestion. Um, and as an introduction to that, really just to, to take you back to uh, the line which you, you mentioned earlier and which is repeated several times in your witness statement about the, the learning you took from that whole experience about, well, I'm not going to say it because I, there are some quite careful words you use in your witness statement. I'd like to show you them. It's page 71, paragraph 225, please. Um, and it, we see um, about four lines down. You say, the most important lesson that I learned and stated repeatedly from the first lockdown onwards in respect to the timing of interventions was that you had to go earlier than you would like, harder than you would like, and broader than you would like. Sometimes people talk about that as go early, go hard, but it's not quite what you say there, is it? And I think the difference is important. Can, can you, just in a few sentences, explain um, this thinking and how you're thinking about this developed during the pandemic? Well, as I mentioned, in the first wave, I think we didn't go early enough. And um, I absolutely... And, and there was a trickle-in of measures when I think we should have gone with more measures simultaneously. And at various other times when geographical uh, areas were put into certain measures, the temptation was always to make it as limited as possible, and then that failed because the surrounding areas immediately got very overwhelmed. Um, so my rider that it's than you would like to is very clear, and that is because the observation I made was that everyone's instincts is to not to do any of these things. It's to delay just a bit too much. It's to argue that the measures shouldn't be quite as strict at the moment, or to argue, and we saw this very clearly during October, and um, I think it was October, where every MP argued that their area shouldn't be in a higher tier, they should be in a lower tier. So everyone's arguing to do things just a little bit less than they should do. The result of that, particularly, and this is important, particularly when there's a high prevalence, and it's worth remembering there was a high prevalence for a lot of that period, means that you tip over into an R above one and then you grow. And so I think this is an important thing, and it's partly my psychology, which is than you like to, and partly just the reality that these things need to be taken into account. Yeah. Now, I, I said that we, we were starting a discussion about segmentation, which was a, uh, a suggestion um, championed by, amongst others, Professor Woolhouse. And you, you will know that his, um, he has another sort of approach which, which, which um, is similar, um, perhaps, to, to what you've described, and I want to explore how different it is. Um, his uh, approach is the earlier you impose an MPI, the less, the, the, the less restrictive it needs to be, um, and therefore he, he, he is very much in favour of imposing moderate MPIs as early as possible. Now, at first blush, that's not the same as go sooner than you like, harder than you like. Um, how much difference is there between those two ideas? Well, it entirely depends on what he means by moderate. And it's obviously very circumstance dependent. My experience is that if you said, I'm going to go very early, but I'm going to go with quite mild um, interventions, the chances are the interventions that were ultimately selected will be even milder than the ones that you thought and you'd be playing catch-up. And I think that's exactly what happened at several stages. People, well-meaning, trying not to put too many restrictions on, would go a little bit lighter than they should have done, and you play catch-up. And I'm, I'm sorry if this is sort of a very obvious point, but I think it's worth just thinking about. There's a lot of focus on the R value, but actually it's the prevalence that matters as well. So if, if to take an extreme the prevalence in the UK was only 10 people had COVID. You could keep R at 1 and feel perfectly happy, and if it went up to 1.2, you'd be able to see it and deal with it. When you're dealing with 50,000 people or 100,000 people with COVID and you're keeping that level R about 1, the moment you break the 1, so you're now growing, you're growing in huge numbers. So this is even more important in a situation where the prevalence is high, 
and you don't want to allow escape from what is a controllable situation to one that then becomes uncontrollable. And, and, and does your this this point about prevalence um, help us in term understand the, the floating of the segmentation idea and how it, and, and perhaps one of the reasons it wasn't pursued because. Would it have been a proposal that would have been much easier to follow at a time of low prevalence, whereas, in fact, as we know, uh, it was proposed um, and discussed over the summer and into the autumn of 2020, which was, of course, a time of rising prevalence? So segmentation, the idea of sort of having one part of the population heavily shielded in some ways, was inherent right from the beginning. Yes, it works much better at low prevalence, just as test, trace, and isolate works much better at low prevalence. I think, though, it's worth remembering that we never found a form of shielding, and Mark Woolhouse may argue, well, well, it never went far enough, and he may be right, but we never found a form of shielding that meant that the prevalence didn't increase in that population at the same time that it increased in the general population. So the risk of running at very high prevalence and shielding is that the moment that prevalence goes up in the general population, it's probably going to go up in your shielded population. You've now put them at risk as well. The other problem with that is that you've then got a lot of people in the general population with COVID. They also will suffer. There will be a problem with subsequent long COVID, and there's a problem with increased viral mutation rates. So lots of things argue against keeping a high prevalence keep it low prevalence, then all sorts of things can work much better. I'm going to come back to the question of long COVID in particular in a moment. Um, but, but, but just sticking with the segmentation proposal for a moment, with hindsight, um, do you think that it might have been a proposal that, that could have been made to work if it had been introduced earlier? Or do you think that the objections you've just really identified, which after all, I mean, we looked at this with Professor Woolhouse at the SAGE minutes where it was discussed and, and refu refused. Do you think that those objections really would always have counted against it? We never really had a really low prevalence situation. And um, I think we, uh, I mean, that proposal of segmentation was there right from the beginning. It was discussed a lot in April. It was rediscussed in great detail in June and July. And um, at that point, I think Professor Woolhouse was also suggesting a sort of super shielding idea, which is a very interesting idea, which is that not only the vulnerable person, but all of their carers and family all get shielded in a, in a group. And we were worried there that the added complication was that would place most burden on multi-generational households, very often in poor um, situations and indeed ethnic minorities where we know multi-generational households are more common. So we were worried that w there were all sorts of problems with this in terms of how you would do it that would ultimately lead to a worse outcome for the shielded population, not a better outcome. But I think the idea of segmentation is a very interesting one. It's the sort of thing that needs to be looked at. And my view is it's much better to try and get that in at a low state of prevalence at a high, than at a high one. And now, you mentioned long COVID. The discussion about segmentation for and against is very, or certainly is capable of being based on COVID itself and the risk of catching the, the acute symptoms or disease. Um, but as you said, the, the concern about long COVID is a slightly separate factor, is it not? Um, and we can see, if we look at the schedule of your notes, um, if we go to 159, yes. Um, this was something uh, that you were concerned of at the time. You say number 10 team segmentation meeting, pushing really hard on segmenting, allowing people back. <coughs> we explained one, young still get ill and may get long-term effects. Is that a reference to, to long COVID there? Yes. Um, and then we see that uh, you refer to some of the other problems that you've just identified. Um, uh, and indeed, you, you also refer to long COVID. We see another reference in your notes. Um, if we look at page 210. Um, th now, here you are um, addressing the Great Barrington Declaration, which, just to be clear, is a, is a, a, much, a, a very different beast to the segmentation ideas that were being developed by Professor Woolhouse. Is that right? Uh, 
Well, they are related. I mean, um, there was part of uh, what was being suggested was segmentation and then allowing the levels to rise in other groups. The Barrington Declaration was at one end of that, which is a complete let it sweep through yep. everybody else. And um, I think Mark Walhouse was not in that position. No. It's a, a much less nuanced approach. But nonetheless, long COVID was, was an objection to the Great Barrington approach uh, when, and one which you've identified here. We see the numbered point four. Um, that on the 6th of October, uh, a note that you make we know the Great Barrington Declaration was current at the time. Um, if we could go on three pages in the notes, please, to page 213, we can see that um, very much at that time, you are also making a note that the Prime Minister was very sceptical about long COVID. It's like Gulf War syndrome. He says we've seen other records from around this time and indeed later where he made this um, or a similar comment. Um, <coughs> Help us with what your understanding of the Prime Minister's view about long COVID was at the time, and also whether, as you understood it, it actually had any impact in terms of policy making, or whether these were really just um, noises off. Uh, I, I think he didn't really think it was uh, a big, big problem. I, I mean, he recognised, because we described th three different um, long-term consequences. There was the post-intensive care syndrome that some people get. That's a well-recognised problem. There was organ damage that some people got from COVID. That's a very well-recognised, clear problem. And there was long COVID, which is much more ill-defined. And I think he was, as it says here, he was sceptical about that. And I don't think was keen to take that into account for policy making. Do you, do you think that there were dis decisions that he made or didn't make, um, which turned on his approach to long COVID. I don't, I don't think so. In the sense that I think he didn't really think it, he didn't really think about it. So it wasn't any active decision based around this. He didn't really want to consider that. I think and you'd have to ask him. Um, but um, there was definitely during this period, the COVID pandemic was running at high levels all the way from August through to the end of that year. And so the recommendation was keep the prevalence low. That was not happening. And the consequence of that is more people with, with uh, long COVID. And I don't think that was, that was something that policymakers were keen to factor in. Right. Um, one more reference, please, in this same document, page 166. That's a few weeks earlier. Um, Uh, here we see Matt Hancock, um, as you say, explain things well for once and remind them about long COVID. So can we take it that Mr Hancock was understanding and alive to the issues of long COVID at about this time? It certainly sounds like it from that. Um, there are many other entries in your diaries which refer to, to, to Mr Hancock, um, Sir Patrick, and you will know that some of the evidence the inquiry has heard from others is that they did not find during this period Mr Hancock to be a reliable, trustworthy colleague. Um, I don't want to take you through a whole load of unnecessary references. Perhaps you can summarise your understanding, your experience of working with Mr Hancock in this sense. I think there's one entry which I, I would support. Which I think he had a habit of saying things which he didn't have a basis for. And um, he would say them too enthusiastically, too early, without the evidence to back them up and then have to backtrack from them days later. I don't know to what extent that was sort of over-enthusiasm versus deliberate, but I think a lot of it was over-enthusiasm, over but he definitely said things which surprised me because I knew that the evidence base wasn't there. He said things that weren't true. Yeah. Um, returning just briefly to long COVID, um, Sir Patrick, and looking a little further ahead, um, as we know, and I'll come to ask you in a moment, um, later on in 2020, there was the second lockdown uh, and then the third lockdown in early January 2021. And moving forward still, a process of unlocking and removing restrictions as one went into the spring, early summer of 2021. Um, one of the risks um, that was 
going to be faced by the population at that stage, in particular perhaps the younger population, was a risk of long COVID. Um, do you think that that risk was flagged sufficiently, taken into account sufficiently by policymakers in that later period? Well, it was definitely flagged. Um, it was a real issue. And I think by that stage in the unlocking, so we're talking about the unlocking in 20... 21. 21. Um, that unlocking was done much better than the previous unlocking, and it was properly uh, monitored with proper gaps in between the stages and the next stage. And indeed, there were examples where the stages were pushed back further in order to allow the prevalence not to rise too high. So I thought that was a much better process and much more more structured and kept prevalence lower than it otherwise would be. Uh, I don't know to what extent long COVID was factored into the thinking of the policymakers on that. Um, well, going back to the period we were looking at um, then and, and sort of second half of 2020, um, we know we've seen references in the diary notes and so on that we've looked at, you've explained prevalence was increasing over the summer and into the autumn. Uh, the, the, the mechanisms that were put in place to um, react, tiers, uh, rule of six and so on. You make clear in your statement uh, that from sort of late September, the view that Sage was expressing was that there ought to be some sort of circuit breaker, um, at least to try and create a pause and to reduce the prevalence. Um, is that a fair summary of the, the sort of general position yes. towards the end of, of the year? And then um, in, in the, what I want to do now is, is look at a series of entries in your notes um, to try and understand the sequence of events running up to the second lockdown. Um, and so if we can start, please, by looking in this schedule that we have in, uh, up at the moment, at page 245, uh, this is Sunday, the 25th of October. Um, and, I mean, before we even look at the content, we, what we will see is that you were attending meetings, giving advice every day of the week over this period. So, Patrick, is seven days a week. Yes. Presumably, at least some of it, working from home, but nonetheless, attending meetings, advising. Was it a, a very high-tempo situation? Well, I think the seven-day-a-week working started in February 2020 and didn't end till well into late 21. I mean, possibly later than that, actually. Um, working, um, were you advising and meet, having meetings with the Prime Minister almost on a daily basis throughout that period? Or? Most of it, yes. Right. Well, let's look at this one. Um, Sunday the 25th, as I said, it starts with the PM meeting begins to argue for letting it all rip. That was almost a term of art, I think, by that stage. Did, perhaps it's obvious, simply removing restrictions and the Great Barrington proposal. Yes, there had been a lot of discussion on that in um, September, and we'd had a meeting at the end of September with some external <coughs> scientists invited in to discuss that as well, and that was something that was very prominent in much of the press as well, and letting it rip became the, um, the expression that people used. Prime Minister saying, yes, there will be more casualties, but so be it. Then in, you've, you've put quotes, <coughs> they've had a good innings. Um, we've seen other references of a similar nature. Was this something that the Prime Minister returned to from time to time, the idea that the, the casualties of, of, of any letting it rip would be older and perhaps special circumstances or that, 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 that they should not so much concern should be had about casualties of that age. Is that really what he was trying to say? I think it's important to note that he might easily have said the following day, I want no deaths at all. Well, we'll come to that. Um, so, uh, I mean, yes, he, he, he must have said that on that day. I mean, we see a few lines down, you've put PM then back on to most people who die have reached their time anyway. Would these be examples of perhaps little notes you made at the time and then... These are probably scribbled notes I wrote on papers of this meeting. A few lines down, PM concludes, looks like we're in a really tough spot, complete shambles. I really don't want to do another national lockdown. This 25th of October, so 
about for about a month would it have been by then that sage the sage advice essentially had been that a circuit breaker lockdown was needed um, and then you dc i'm looking at the last nine now dc dominic cummings says rishi thinks just let people die and that's okay and then this feels like a complete lack of leadership is that your comment at the end there uh yes i think so i mean perhaps it's obvious is that, again tell us is this one of your late night um, furious thinking, or do, is it something you, you would stand by now? Well, it, it must have felt like a complete lack of leadership on that day, and it, it, reading it, it feels like quite a shambolic day. Um, and to put things in context, that's Mr Cummings saying that that was um, <coughs> the thought that let's let people die. It's not necessarily, you didn't hear that from the um, Rishi Sunak himself. That is what Dominic Cummings said. Reported, yeah. yes. Um, let's just move on in the sequence, please. And to do this, let's go into the transcript so we can see a sort of full record of your notes rather than just extracts for this next few days. And because, as you say, um, there were changes. So if we can look at the uh, 280061, page 240, please. Yes, thank you. So we see a a date which is just disappearing off the top, the 26th. So this is the next day, the Monday. Uh, and as you say, Sir Patrick, it, it appears the Prime Minister, you've recorded, in fact, he's in a different mood. Uh, terrible, terrible, terrible numbers. Um, says we need to do local lockdowns fast, foot to the throttle, accelerate. He's so inconsistent. So previous day, letting it rip. This day, something very different by the look of it. Yes. Um, and, and then, if we can go on to the next page, please. There's a, a similar observation. Um, on Sunday, uh, all the Prime Minister wanted was a sense of mutually incompatible outcomes, said Simon Case, privately. That's to you, I take it. I think that must have been in a call with me. Uh, uh, owns something for a day and then changes. That's his comment. A um, couple of lines further down, we're now into the next day, the Tuesday. Um, you record the number of deaths. Um, this takes us back perhaps to a comment you made this morning, which is to compare what was happening in October with what was happening in the run-up to the first lockdown, when, of course, there were far fewer deaths um, at that stage than there were by then. I think on the 16th of March, there was something like 51 deaths. And now we're talking about nearly 400 per day. Um, and your observation, everything we said is happening and still no action, is that a reference to advice you'd given? Well, tell us, dating back how long? Uh, I think it dated back from um, a press conference that Chris Whitty and I had done on the 21st of September and indeed to many SAGE papers and spy -in papers that had come out in the meantime. Let's look back, uh, look over the page if we can. That takes us to the 28th, the Wednesday. Um, there's, a, there's a, you say, PM dashboard. Was that a, a meeting with the Prime Minister and his That's close the morning. There was a morning meeting just to go through numbers and have an update called the dashboard meeting. And about five or six lines down, we say, PM completely obsessed with testing as the solution, even as the number's so bad that it's obvious more action is needed. Explain um, why uh, your reflection was that, that testing wasn't an appropriate or a sufficient uh, answer to the problem at that stage? Well, there was a proposal that was uh, gaining um, traction, which was a good one, on mass testing as a way to reduce the uh, incidence in the population, which was everybody would test on one day and then everyone who's positive would isolate. And that would definitely have cut things down a bit. But of course, you've then got to repeat it and you've got to do it several times. And as that was being worked up as a sort of moonshot, um, it just wasn't feasible at that time. There weren't enough tests, the right sort of tests. It wasn't practical to do it. And I worried that as people were looking at that as the solution, 
we were seeing numbers go up anyway and that there were some other things that could happen to try and get the numbers down. Yeah. And then if we look um, further down the page, um, we can see a line saying, so a bit further than that. Yeah, no, sorry, that's fine. No. Um, three lines up. The Prime Minister, resistant to national lockdown, wants to continue with regional. Um, but then both above that and below it, there are observations by you um, that um, it's not enough to deal with the, the areas in the higher tiers. You need to deal with what you describe here as lower prevalence areas as well. Um, you mentioned earlier the issue with lower prevalence areas um, having their uh, incidence rising. Is that what you're referring to here? Yes, um, because test, trace and isolate has a limited capacity and it's actually rather effective when you have low prevalence. So you can keep a lid on, on low prevalence with that. Once it gets swamped, it becomes totally irrelevant because it's been swamped and the prevalence will increase. I was worried at this time that for all sorts of reasons, test, trace and isolate was being surged into high prevalence areas where it wasn't going to make any difference and it would have been more effective to have used it widely in low prevalence areas to keep them low and dealt with the high prevalence areas with other means. So the, 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 the passage in your witness statement where you say that SAGE urged the government to look beyond current prevalence as the trigger point for moving between tiers. So is this really making the same point that one should try and keep the lower prevalence areas low rather than uh, just allowing them to move up? Yes, because, because unfortunately the tier system was such that, and as I said already, many people were arguing that their only area should be in the lowest tier possible. Well, that was the surest way to end up in a high, t high tier. Yeah. Let's move over the page, please. Um, we're still on the Wednesday, uh, and about three lines down we see you've made a note, France and Germany have acted. France, I think, took our circuit break idea and applied it. We sent them the papers. Is that a recollection that you had have now, or obviously something you thought at the yeah, time? Well, I, I'd organised meetings between science advisers from about eight European countries. We met every couple of weeks, sometimes every week, very informal meetings where we just shared information and advice, and we often shared papers, and we'd, they'd asked us about the circuit breaker idea, and we'd sent them the papers. I have no idea whether it is what triggered them to, to uh, take action or not. Just above the um, redaction, towards the bottom of the page, we, we see here uh, an extract we looked at earlier. Apparently, the Cabinet Office now cautious about putting things to SAGE because we publish it all. That's a very bad outcome. It's notable that this happened at this time of increased tension. Uh, I think you said earlier that you weren't convinced that, in fact, anything ever came of that concern. D did you, in fact, think that at this time you, there were things that you might have been asked about but weren't? because of this caution? I, I suspect, and I'm sorry, I can't remember, that I would have had a direct conversation with Simon Case and said, that's not OK. Right. We've got to see things. And I, I don't think that they... they I, I don't think Cabinet Office ever did not bring something to us because they were worried about it. But clearly there was a mood that it might happen. And then just above that, we see you have referred to the press and then said, we have a weak, indecisive PM. Again, is that something um, that, on reflection, you stand by, or was that a late-night uh, brain dump? Well, it was definitely a late-night moment of frustration. Um, I, I do think that the Prime Minister was influenced a lot by the press. Let's go over the page, please. Um, we, we are on now to the Thursday of that week, 29th of October. Uh, and. You make a reference immediately under the date to a call with the Cabinet Office, I assume, um, and you say, I argued strongly for the Prime Minister to set out his aims. What does he want to achieve? Protect the NHS, something else, emergency care, all care. And this takes its back, does it not, to a point we raised earlier about scientists needing to understand exactly what the government was trying to achieve other perhaps than just stopping the NHS being overwhelmed. That was uh, in March 
uh, the, where we were talking about it this morning, it looks as though that concern arose again at this time. Yes, possibly even intensified at this time. Just help us. What, I mean, what, what would you have liked to have been told that you weren't being told? I think it would have been very useful, for example, they might have said, all we care about is NHS collapse. Just work to only that. But that isn't all they cared about, because on some days it was, we can't stand the numbers of deaths and we want to have this lower. So then that begs the question, so what's the target? If that's not the target, is it that you want to have all routine care in the NHS running properly and cope with COVID? Or is it something else, which is we'd like um, to manage the NHS as effectively as we can, but with the economy being in a stronger position with more things open? I mean, there are several different permutations that one could think of uh, that would have been helpful to then um, be able to ensure that we tailor the advice accordingly. I think in your witness statement, you describe a, a feedback session or with with some of the scientists who worked on SAGE and its subcommittees and this feeling that they weren't didn't have a clear understanding of government policy was one of if not the sort of top issue that that, that you heard and in fact it's something that we've heard in evidence ourselves so I mean, is that a learning point for next time? It is a learning point to lay that out as clearly as possible I, I do want to just offer one slightly pragmatic observation though which is I've worked in global multinational companies and many other things, and everyone always says, I don't think the strategy is clear enough wherever you are. So I think we shouldn't dream that setting out the policy clearly is going to be something that satisfies this need, but I don't think it was clear enough at that point. Yeah. Um, we can go on two pages, because the next, one's, next one is a blank, um, but it takes us then into the Friday of that week, and in fact... Yeah, so page 246, that's it. Um, and we can see towards the bottom of that page, again, uh, the same point. We have pushed all week that the key is for the PM to define his aims. You've underlined it, but he still hasn't done that. Uh, and a similar point raised, clearly a matter of continuing concerns. That, is that fair? Uh, and then um, at the bottom of the page, um, we know that there was a lengthy meeting that on that Friday, or possibly more than one meeting, we see PM meeting at the bottom there, do you see that? And then if we scroll onto the next page, um, there is a, a few entries, and then about halfway down the page, PM dashboard meeting. Would that have been a separate meeting or a continuation of the first one? Or, or a separate meeting, I think. Um, were the, these meetings taking place remotely, or would you have been in Downing Street, or can't you remember? Uh, they were a mix. I can't, I can't remember this one. Uh, a lot of the meetings were taking place in person. Now, we, we're now on the Friday of that week, and we know that there were events over the weekend when this lockdown was announced. And I, I think what we see in the next few pages is a fairly lengthy debate, is it not, about whether a national lockdown should or shouldn't be imposed. And you obviously sat down that night and, uh, and wrote quite a lot of notes just at the end of that day. Um, let's... Um, go over the page piece to 248. We, we, you've made an entry just under the first redaction that Simon Case sent you a WhatsApp to say national lockdown on Monday, French style. Well, we know you, we saw that the French had just imposed a lockdown. Um, I, and you say, I wonder what that really looks like. So were you, do you think you were being told there that that decision had been made? Yes. Um, if, would that have been during the meeting or that you were in? Or, 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 no, no, it must have been in another meeting that I didn't know about. I see, I see. Because you then carry on describing a meeting with the PM, um, and we see you refer there to graphs on projections that suddenly got given to the Cabinet Office without me seeing them, and they will become significant over the next day or so, will, will they not? Um, <coughs> and then a couple of lines further down, Prime Minister says, we need to act, French-style national lockdown. So again, it, it appears that a decision was being made, but the notes that follow suggest that there may have been a certain amount of toing and froing. Can, can you help us? Well, it looks from this as though the decision probably had been made in another meeting, and there have been weeks of build-up to what needed to happen. Um, and uh, this meeting sounds like it was an update on the situation, and the PM 
reiterated what Simon had already told me in a WhatsApp was going to happen. Because um, if we go over the page again, and we're still on that Friday... I think that's Homeric logic at the bottom of that page. Yes. is a mistake. Not Homeric. Hmm. Um, there's then a discussion where, amongst other things, the Prime Minister talks about a painting. But uh, about four lines down, you see the Prime Minister then argues that letting it go may be the better economic route. Um, and, and further down the page, just falling off the bottom at the moment, so the case is weaker if we're just arguing about saving lives, as they're all very old anyway. So it, on that argument, it would, on that basis, it would seem that a decision hadn't been made at that point. Or, or is that not right? That's what it looks like. Uh, were these records recording the sort of toing and froing or the of the arguments at the meeting? I think I was just recording, as far as, as, far as I can tell from what, what's written, exactly what happened over the course of, of the day, with things changing from meeting to meeting, depending on who was there and what had happened in between. And you weren't clear whether there was going to be a lockdown or not, presumably? No, it looked like there was, but it was difficult to tell. Um, and then over the page, someone has said... Uh, these are truly horrible decisions. Dominic Cummings says the only reason not to do it now is if you won't ever do it. Prime Minister says, should we just level with the public, say we'll tough it out and tell them there will be deaths. And Lee Kane, who's given evidence to this effect, essentially says there needs to be a lockdown. I don't see any world in which we don't act. And then going over the page one more time, still on that Friday... Um, you say meeting ended with no decision and going round in circles. Too many unknowns. We need to look in our windscreen, avoid a car crash. Deaths will be unacceptable, and so on. Um, although then, further down the page again, 28-day lockdown. Um, we're obviously just looking at your notes, Sir Patrick. The notes convey a suggestion of a great deal of indecision on that day. Does that align with your memory? Your, your I think this was a time of... Ex I mean, it, this was almost a microcosm of what had been going on for the previous weeks with the incidents, prevalence and R changing a bit and people moving from one position to another. And uh, the Prime Minister would take a certain position in one meeting and then perhaps another one later on. And sometimes, I think, was also trying to test people's positions and find out whether they really held to what yes. they were saying. But these, these meetings largely looked to me like they were meetings that um, probably Chris Whitty and I were there to provide information as requested rather than as active participants in what was a policy discussion. What we know, and you describe this in your witness statement, is that that night, that Friday night, there was a leak. And so the next morning on Saturday, um, there were reports that a lockdown was going to be ordered. Uh, and uh, there was then a sort of hastily arranged press conference. If we go over to the next page, um, you, you record that in your notes. This is now Saturday the 31st. Frantic day, whole thing leaked into the media. Um, everyone can see action is needed. Some people are pushing hard against it. We suddenly have to do a press, a press conference today. Why not keep it quiet, get it right over the weekend, and then announce properly on Monday? It's clear from the tone of this that you felt it had obviously been the case, somewhat sort of bounced into making an announcement. Well, um, or, or, or being part of an announcement. Yeah, being bounced into the press conference. So, so the, the, the sequence was that a graph that had been to SPIM had been taken from SPIM directly into number 10 that we were unaware of. Uh, I think Ben Warner took it in. And we got rather sort of blindsided by this bit having been shown to the Prime Minister and the number 10 team on Friday. Um, and we, at that time, said, I think you shouldn't take too much note of this graph because it's a reasonable worst-case scenario. You should look at the six-week medium-term projections, which was showing exactly where things were going and were much more reliable examples of what was happening, which is pretty grim. Um, 
and then overnight on, on Friday, having the policy people having made the decision they were going to do a lockdown, that was leaked, the, the decision was leaked to the press. Yeah. And then if we look on the next page, we come back to this slide point that the, it says the PM has latched on to that and the one of the NHS collapsing as the reason <coughs> for doing it. And he was furious that he'd based a decision on a slide that I, that's you, was now having to slightly row back from. And you describe it, there being a, a sort of demand, a requirement from number 10 that the slide be used in the press conference. You subsequently, in a subsequent note, say that you said it shouldn't be, but in the end you were persuaded that it should. Now, this incident has become the subject of some debate. So tell us in your, in your own words what, what the rest of that part of the story was. Well, so we, we were called in to do the press conference, Chris Wisdy and I, and we were then in a room for three hours or four hours, I think, when the Prime Minister was making calls to various backbenchers and other people and then at the press to try and get people on the right side to that decision. Um, as I said, we've been clear the night before that this slide was a reasonable worst-case scenario, and that's not a good thing to show on a press conference because it's so complicated to explain what a reasonable worst-case scenario is and that we should simply only show the medium-term projections, six-week medium-term projections, which made the case. And Simon Stevens had also said the NHS is going to collapse if we don't do something. And we said that's an important statement. It would be good to have Simon standing at the press conference saying that, if that's the case. Um, the, uh, those three or four hours we were in the room waiting, the message came back several times that um, the Prime Minister felt that as he had seen this slide, it was only right that the public saw it and that we had to show it. And I think in the end, we agreed that I would show the slide, but try and move on to the medium term projections, which were the real thing. And I think that argument, I've seen it, therefore the public should see it, carries some legitimacy. Um, with hindsight, was this one of those moments that we talked about earlier where you, as sort of an independent advisor to the government, was being drawn uncomfortably close to being aligned with certain policy decisions? Well, may maybe. I, I mean, it was a slide. I did check because the slide had appeared from, as I say, nowhere into number 10. I did check with the spy and people that they were stand behind this slide, and it was the right slide, and it had got the right validation through spy m so there was nothing wrong with it in terms of its sort of scientific origins and its validity it was more of i just didn't think it was a sensible thing to show at a press conference because these are complicated things to explain reasonable worst case scenarios it wasn't really the issue the issue is what's going to happen in the next six weeks not what a theoretical unmitigated scenario looks like over the next several months um, so I think it was. I think I made a mistake to agree to show it, um, and I think in retrospect, probably what I should have done. Maybe I even did do this. I can't remember. Was phoned Simon Case and said I'm being put under a lot of pressure to do something I don't think I want to do, but I didn't have any worries about its sort of scientific legitimacy. It, it had come through a proper process and was a reasonable slide. I just thought it was not a sensible slide to show. Yeah. Um, subsequently. Um, did the, the modellers, the people who had provided you that information, did they stand by that slide or did they subsequently start to suggest that maybe their, their, their modelling wasn't quite what you had thought it was? Well, they, they stood behind the fact it was a reasonable worst case scenario from three weeks before and that's what it showed. And like me, thought that's not the one I, you know, you, you'd want to be showing today. And then, of course, inevitably the reasonable worst case scenario evolved and changed subsequently but it was say it was not a slide that they said is not is is not correct it was correct for what it was yes right um so perhaps just finally i want to move on to one final point which is um perhaps something we haven't uh dealt with as fully as we should have done um which is we we we've, i've asked you a lot of questions about the sage structure committees the advice and so on um you of course were a paid civil servant, you were doing your job um, in everything that we've described. Um, but it's also right to say, isn't it, that that whole structure of advice below you uh, relied on voluntary assistance uh, from expert scientists who took time away uh, from what they would otherwise have been doing voluntarily 
are unpaid to feed into that system. And as uh, you said to my lady, um, in some cases at least, suffered um, some difficulties as a result of that. Um, it, as with other aspects of the SAGE system, this was another example of the system being tested in a way it hadn't been tested before. Um, is that element of the system, the dependence on unpaid voluntary assistance, uh, viable in another pandemic? Can I just make one other comment about the slide, which is after the press conference, the Prime Minister said to me, you skipped over that pretty quickly and went on to the other ones, didn't you? And so, was he right? Yes. <laughs> and I caveated it very heavily. Um, I, I, I do think that there was an extraordinary effort of altruism from scientists right the way across the country to work on this unpaid, gave up their normal uh, work all hours of the night and day, some of them, and some of them subject to abuse and physical threat. And it was extraordinary to see it and a fantastic example of why funding a broad research base in the UK, both academic and industrial, is important for the resilience and success of the country. So I, I thought they were fantastic. I think we put too much on them, and some of them we needed to, um, I think, give more breaks than we did, and we should have implemented a payment system to backfill teaching commitments and so on, which we did, but, but it was difficult to get that going in the middle of a pandemic. We did get it going. All that said, I think the mechanism, i.e. to pull on world-leading, active academic researchers is the right one, rather than to build a big intra-government infrastructure to do this. I think that worked, and we were very fortunate to have the level of input, skills, debate, dissent, challenge that we had as a result of that. So I'm not sure I would dramatically change that beyond things like make sure we get the diversity right, make sure we get the geographical diversity right, make sure we have ways to pay people so they can backfill teaching and make sure we provide both psychological and security support for people. Um, Ms. Patrick, thank you very much. Maybe those are all my questions. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a break now and I shall return at half past three and I can undertake, Mr so Patrick, I'll almost do a United States Supreme Court and stop people in mid-sentence. We will definitely be finished by five o'clock at the very latest. I'm sorry it's such a long day for you. All right.
Mr Weatherby, are you going first? So I'm, I, I meant to check when we had the break and I'm afraid I forgot to do so. Thank you very much. Um, so Patrick, uh, I represent the COVID brief Families for Justice UK, representing bereaved families from across the UK. There are just two topics that uh, I'm going to cover, and I, I'll be well within the, the time estimate. I was going to share my time with Mr Wilcock and my lady, but in fact, Mr O'Connor's covered his questions. Oh, I see. So right. Thank I'll, you. I'll be within the time. Thank you, Mr um, But I, I want to return to a point Mr O'Connor raised about... Um, uh, and I'm quoting here, how many deaths were acceptable? I just want to explore that in a little more detail with you. So um, in, in your statement, that's the term that you use, and the, the context of it is the middle of February of 2020, and you observe that the, the, this is a question that was put to ministers but never answered. Uh, and today you very fairly indicated, of course, it's a very difficult question for... Um, um, an elected representative to actually come out and, and, and answer. But nevertheless, it's a central point for you as a scientific advisor, isn't it? It, it is, because yeah. everything, a lot follows from that. Indeed. And uh, it's so central that by April, you and I think Professor Whitty provided an advice paper about different approaches, and you refer to it in your statement as um, hot or cold policy or somewhere in the middle. And, the, and you're explaining to government there in April how important it is that, first of all, they have a strategy, but also that you as ad advisers know about it. Yes? Yes. Uh, and that question was never, in fact, answered through the whole period, was it? No, not with any um, specificity. And that's why... Um, again, going back to your statement, and just for the record, paragraph 406, um, you're dealing with the um, lessons learned, in fact, from the second lockdown. And your first observation is that the first lesson um, that should have been learned uh, was the same as should have been learned from the first wave, go earlier, harder, and broader on the introduction of MPIs. Yes? That's a clear lesson. That yeah. We've and then the, your second lesson was um, um, where you return to this issue and you say uh, there was a need to establish, quote, some greater degree of clarity on the level of mortality or morbidity the government and so society were willing to accept for an, end, uh, for an epidemic, unquote. Uh, and, and that there is bookending it, February, and then looking at your observations on the second wave, the same concern you're not being provided with the strategy, and that makes it much more difficult for you as advisors to give uh, advice in good time so that swift, real-time, efficient and effective decisions can be taken. Is that a fair summary? I think it was illustrated in the um, quotes that Mr O'Connor showed of, of me asking what is the Prime Minister's aim and objective? Yes. Uh, so the answer to my question is, is, is yes. Yes. That's the, that's the problem. I'm going to come to just one more of those messages in, in a minute. But before I do, um, in, in order to give proper scientific advice, you've got to re research, you've got to model, um, uh, and that's the only way that you can provide very fast, real-time advice. Is that, is that right? Um, well, the only way to provide real-time advice is to build on the knowledge you have at that moment. Yes, but in the context of, of an overall strategy. Yes. So, um, eat out to help out. You, you've already told us that you didn't know anything about the um, this policy decision until after it had been taken. Correct. Um, you've also told us that it inevitably increased the number of infections, and therefore it must follow, mustn't it, the it must have increased the number of deaths. It's highly likely to have yes. done so. Uh, and, and you say, um, paragraph 348, just for the, for the record, um, that you have, quote, no doubt that the decision makers would have understood the general advice that I and others had given before the introduction of the scheme, that it would increase viral transmission and potentially quite substantially, unquote. 
So you're, you're saying there that although you weren't asked to advise, you've no, you've, you've no doubt that those who took the decision understood the general points about the increase of transmissibility. Is that right? I think I'll answer that earlier on as well, that, that it must be the case because it was a complete sort of turn on its head of the public yeah. health advice. And then in the next paragraph, you go on to say that these principles, and I'm quoting, these principles were clear and had been discussed with ministers and cabinet, uh, unquote, and that, quote, it was entirely predictable, unquote. So you're not leaving much room for doubt about the, um, not only the effect of Eat Out to Help Out, but also the fact that ministers were aware of what its likely effect would be well, when they took a decision. Well, that was certainly my view when I, I wrote yes. this. Yes, that's very clear. Thank you very much. The second point relates to a notebook entry, um, your diary uh, entry of the 11th of October, and it's again picking up from a topic that Mr O'Connor's dealt with. Um, it, and I do want to put this on screen, please. It's INQ 000 uh, 273901, page 220. And uh, I think it bears reading. Uh, press conference tomorrow, 11th of October 2020. Press conference tomorrow. Mm. I'm now dropped in favour of CX. That's the Chancellor of the Exchequer, yes? Yes. Uh, good. They need to understand and own the decisions they're making. COVID O, um, being asked to approve the measures knowing that it is not enough, gave the example that Bolton worked, but only because hospitality fully <coughs> closed. This is a massive abrogation of responsibility. And then, I won't read the next bit, but you go on to deal with individual ministers and um, what you thought of, of their position was. Um, and then you refer to the fact that, that this is relating to, I think, a Zoom meeting. And, and you say, whilst waiting, some, someone clearly not on mute, baby crying, and then she starts singing the wheels on the bus, somehow symbolic of the shambles. PM said on call, the package we have as a baseline is unlikely to get R less than one unless local leaders go further. Hancock says, this is our last shot at avoiding national lockdown meek as mice from cabinet ministers. Now again, for context, this is referring to the, the fact that COVID-O, the ministerial and officials meeting, had, a, had been looking at a package of me measures which were not consistent with the September SAGE 58 meeting uh, advice. And, and that advice had been um, this um, robust call for a circuit breaker um, and a suite of MPIs, given the exponential resurgence of COVID at that time. Is that right? I think this is a discussion of tears, if I'm yes. um, correct. Um, and, and it's a very clear um, statement that the tears were not going to be strong enough to keep R below one, yes. as but the Prime Minister says. So your frustration here is that SAGE has given forceful advice that what is actually required is a circuit breaker. And COVID-O are still discussing with ministers in directly involved about trying to make an alternative suite of measures work. And your frustration is that they're ignoring SAGE uh, and trying to follow a course that won't work. Uh, I think the message is not so much around a circuit breaker as the tiers need to be stricter at the yeah. top end if they're going to have an impact. And this is me in the evening referring my frustration that that's very clear and the Prime Minister says as much. R will not below, go below one unless local leaders go further than the tier system. OK. So, but uh, you're expressing a very strong view here, aren't you? The, the, first of all, that... Um, the press conference, which you thought you were down to do, um, was now going to be dealt with by a minister, the Chancellor, Mr Sunak. Um, and you were happy about that because you didn't want to be putting across this view that was contrary to the uh, scientific advice that had been given to government. I think these are different sections, 
stitched together. So I'm not quite sure how they flow on in terms of things. But yes, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have wanted to be in the in, in the press conference, yeah. and uh, I would have said. R will not be brought below one. I think I did at other press conferences. Yeah, so you, you're, you're clearly saying um, that ministers should own the decisions where they're standing away from the scientific advice that, that you were being conveying to them. That is the case. Yeah, yes. and you were saying it in forthright terms, a, a massive abrogation of responsibility. That's the only way you can read that, isn't it? Yes, I mean, again, th that's obviously what I thought that night yeah. when I wrote these notes. OK, well, again, that's very clear. Thank you. Finally, this. Can you just help us with the last sentence? I mean, it, the, the, the baby crying and the wheels on fire, uh, wheels on the bus might be quite clear. But what, what did you mean by Hancock says this is our last shot at avoiding national lockdown? Mika's mice from cabinet ministers. Again, it's a bit difficult to know because th th these are it looks like they're selected um, sections with something in between. I, I, I'm sure that that's a reference to uh, Mr. Hancock saying at the cabinet meeting, this is the last shot at avoiding a national lockdown and probably trying to implore his um, colleagues to go further. And um, it sounds like there wasn't much of a cabinet discussion. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Weatherby. So no questions, Mr. Lockett. No, lady, they were covered by Mr. O'Connor. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gowman. Oh, to find you. <laughs> Thank you, my lady. Sir Patrick, I ask questions on behalf of COVID-19 bereaved families for Justice Cymru. Uh, my questions are centred around the interactions with the devolved administrations, and in particular Wales. Firstly, focusing on your role as the Chair of SAGE, uh, please can we bring up Exhibit 216615. Now, on the 26th of May 2020, uh, the First Minister for Wales, Mark Drakeford, wrote to you in your capacity as the Chair of SAGE, requesting the ability to engage more directly in the work of SAGE, and specifically in respect of the development of the evidence base, and looking to commission work directly from SAGE. And please can we bring up Exhibit 216616. Here we see the list of modelling questions that accompanied that letter that the Welsh Government wanted SAGE to answer. And my questions are these. Uh, to your knowledge, had any requests been made by the Welsh Government to commission work directly from SAGE prior to the 20 26th of May 2020? Uh, I don't think a direct request... Well, I know a direct request hadn't come from the First Minister before then. It's possible that the representatives from Wales had got pieces of work done through subcommittees before that. Um, and are you aware whether SAGE complied with the First Minister's requests of, of the 26th of May? I replied a few days later and said that um, Rob Orford, their acting Chief Scientific Advisor for Health, I met with him, went through all of these requests, made sure he was linked into SPI-M, which is the modelling group, and that he'd realised the papers that had gone before, which were in the public domain, that he'd seen anyway because he was on SAGE, yeah. and uh, that these were very, very specific modelling requests, probably, no, definitely too granular to answer properly with modelling, and that there may be some advice that could be given, but it was not going to be possible to model this sort of degree of granularity. All you'd end up with is spurious accuracy. Um, and um, insofar as the second point raised by the First Minister within his letter, uh, did SAGE take up the Welsh Government's offer to support the development of the evidence base? Yes, I, I, we got a lot of very useful information fed in through Rob Orford and Fliss Benny, who were the two um, uh, people from Wales on SAGE. Um, there are references several times to the useful information, and it was also very helpful because there were minor differences in policies between devolved administrations that did allow us to try and look and see what effect things were having. Um, 
Thank you, Sir Patrick. Um, moving on to your role as the UK government's chief scientific advisor, um, what was the role, if any, of the ch chief scientific advisors across the devolved administrations, including yourself, in the coordination of advice and policies across the four nations? Um, well, the four nations worked very closely together at a scientific and medical level. The chief medical officer met with the CMOs of the four nations very re regularly, at least once a week, I think, right from the very beginning. And we had representatives on SAGE. I also had a direct, long-standing relationship with the chief scientific advisors for Scotland and Wales, um, one of whom was involved in COVID and one of whom Wales decided wasn't involved in COVID and suggested Rob Orford and Fliss Benny be linked to SAGE. So I think we had them involved in SAGE. We also created a SAGE chairs meeting where specific things were brought up relating to devolved administrations and others that could then be put into the work plan. And separately, I had regular meetings with the overall chief scientific advisers for the devolved administrations, except Northern Ireland, who didn't have one. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, it, it follows from, from that question, um, my, my next question, where, where there were proposed divergences in policy between devolved administrations, uh, were these ever discussed between the chief scientific advisers across the devolved administrations in advance of implementation? Um, the science advice was uniform pretty much across the four nations. The policy decisions diverged and um, I think there was probably more discussion amongst the CMOs because most of the decisions were more in their territory yeah. than in the CSA territory. But um, they were obviously re regionally important distinctions and policy preferences that were um, uh, that altered between the nations. Thank you. And, and finally, um, did the ch chief scientific advisers from the devolved governments have access to information, including data, on an equal footing to yourself to enable a fully informed exchange of views in any meetings that you had with them uh, across uh, the four nations? They saw all of the information at SAGE and um, the chief, the, the person who chaired the Scottish um, committee, Andrew Morris, actually is the chair of um, Health Data Research UK, which is the big data repository. So he probably had rather more information than I did from time to time, but uh, he was very careful to make sure that we all saw everything. Um, so from your perspective, um, you didn't consider that the devolved administrations were disadvantaged in their access to data? I don't think so. I mean, there, there may be specific examples, but I don't know of any. And there were certainly many examples where the data that came from the devolved administrations was incredibly important. Um, I'd s single out Scotland in particular there uh, with some of their work with their electronic health databases and the EVE study, which was incredibly important. Uh, thank you, Sir Patrick. Thank you, my lady. No thank you, Ms. Garman. That leads us nicely to you, Ms. Mitchell. Sir Patrick, I appear as instructed by Amar Anwar and Company on behalf of the Scottish COVID bereaved. And uh, just me perhaps taking things out of order, but as you spoke there about Eve 2, it might be best if I can take you to one of my questions on that. Um, in the course of giving your statement to this inquiry, um, you said at paragraph 45H, that doesn't require to be brought up unless uh, you would like it, that you said that uh, data that you got from Scotland included electronic health records and the EVE 2 studies, which you considered was very useful and provided rapid information. Firstly, can you assist the inquiry with what the EVE 2 is? And then also, can you explain to the inquiry why it was particularly useful? So e e the EVE studies were run by Aziz Sheikh um, from Scotland, and it was a very effective way of looking at electronic databases held in Scotland and health records to give early signals on things. So we got information from there, everything from rates in Scotland, early indications of changes, through to very important data on the uh, vaccine efficacy. 
uh, which led to multiple publications in top tier international journals and was a continued source of helpful information into uh, SAGE and to other bodies. And am I correct in saying that some of the data comes from GP notes and indeed the data was able presumably then to cover what is approximately 98% of Scotland? Yeah, I think Scotland has done over the years a brilliant job of getting um, health records, both primary and secondary care health records, and linking them. And that's been a, a, a piece of work that was done a long time ago, and it really came into its own during this to be able to provide very useful information. Thank you. I wonder if I can now turn to um, your role in SAGE and ask you some questions about that. The, the first uh, thing I want to ask you about is, um, uh, um, I suppose, it would be informing the policy makers. We've heard this morning the job that you went to to try and ensure policy makers were well informed before taking decisions. And you said neatly that you provided science for policy rather than policy for science. You said, uh, and I caught, that um, you did teach-ins. And you, those were large, you said, in fact, uh, um, up to 170 people. I'm obviously assuming these are all online. Was that correct? Yeah, they, well, they, I'm, I'm pretty sure they were all online. Um, I, I didn't take part in them. They were various chairs of subcommittees. So Kath Noakes, who chaired the um, transmission subgroup, was absolutely brilliant at giving um, tutorials inside Whitehall. I think they were probably all virtual. Uh, my question really then focuses on that a particular issue. Th were these teachings only given within Whitehall? I don't know for sure. I suspect the answer is yes, but I don't know for certain. And the agreement was with the chief scientific advisers and indeed the, the chief medical officers from devolved administration that they would take the information to the devolved administrations to make sure that people understood it there. Whether they ever got people like Kath Noakes to give the teachings to them or whether they were able to get copies of it. I'm sorry, I just don't know. Would you consider that if policymakers from the devolved administrations were given the same opportunity as policymakers in Whitehall, that would have been of assistance to them in forming their policies? Yeah, I think they were completely open to get it. So I, what I just don't know is whether the chief scientific advisers from the devolved administrations actioned that to make it happen or not, but it was there and available if people wanted it. And I certainly had a discussion I can't remember when now, with one of the uh, Scottish ministers directly who wanted to speak to me about something. And was that in relation to finding out more about a particular topic to inform themselves? Yes, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember what it, what it, what it was now. It was during, during a visit that I made. Well, we, we will uh, hear from Scottish politicians in Module 2A, so perhaps someone will be able to advise us at, at that time. In relation to discussions with um, politicians or indeed others, I'd like to move on to the next topic, which is the issue of borders. Now, in your statement, you speak of borders and you're discussing them in relation to international borders. What I am uh, wanting to ask you about is whether or not there were any discussions about border controls between the borders of Scotland and England or England and Wales. Our science advice on borders was very clear to stick away, to stay away from policy. And our advice was really quite simple, which is border control measures are of importance when the country that you are talking about has a much higher prevalence than the current prevalence in the UK or in one of the nations of the UK. And that's when border measures could make a difference. And that in order to be effective, border measures needed to be extremely stringent and even if extremely stringent would delay rather than stop importation of cases and particularly variants is what we were thinking of. So that, that pretty much was the science advice summarised rather, rather briefly but, but it didn't go further than that. We never said what you should do in any particular border, that, that was a policy decision. So, for example, when the prevalence of COVID was 
almost entirely London-based to begin with, based in England, there was no discussion about the possibility of closing the border in Scotland or in Wales? I, I don't recall that being a discussion, but there may well have been policy people thinking about that. I don't know. But certainly you weren't part of that. I never before. heard that suggestion. Moving on to my final uh, issue, and that is in relation to the issue of masks in schools. You may recall, Sir Patrick, that uh, uh, the Scottish Government decided masks would be used in schools, and thereafter England followed suit at some point in August of 2020. Do you recall that? Uh, I recall that happened, yes. Yes. I wonder uh, if we can have up uh, inquiry number 000 273901, pages 148. Do we see uh, your entry records? Scotland breaks ranks over face coverings and schools, despite CMO having worked hard to get all CMOs aligned to a very good statement released the day before. Now, I just want to check that's your personal observation, I take it, and not anyone that you're recording. That is my personal observation of what happened. I see. And why do you use the phrase break ranks? What I'm really trying to explore is why was it a good idea to ensure that everybody was doing the same thing? I think this was a CMO to CMO thing. I wasn't really involved in this discussion, but I think the CMOs were very keen that uh, the four nations worked together and that the advice was similar across the four nations. This was medical advice being given. didn't come from SAGE and didn't come from me. But they wanted to work together. They'd reached an agreement and they'd given consistent advice across all four nations. That's obviously the advice. The policy was clearly different. So from a scientific perspective, from your perspective, there wasn't a necessary need to keep all four consistent. We always anticipate we, there was a, there was a very important need to make sure that we had appropriately aligned science advice where it was right to do so. I mean, it's highly unlikely the science advice would be different in the four nations. In fact, it was hardly different across the whole of Europe. The policy choices are obviously for politicians, and they they will differ as as politicians wish them to differ. I wonder if we could have that same inquiry number document, uh, page one five one. Now, this reads Hancock, praising himself for mask decision. He knows that Scotland decision was not based on medical advice, brackets, i.e. it was totally political, close brackets. Now, can you assist the inquiry with whether or not you are simply recording what his view was or what your view was? Well, it's definitely not my, my view. I mean, my, my view was the advice had been given and it was consistent across the four nations. Anything else was politics. So... It, so if we see here, um, just to be clear, if we see here, um, he knows that Scotland decision was not based on medical advice. No part of that is you saying that it wasn't medical advice. Indeed, as far as you're aware, it was consistent with medical advice. All, all I think if it's the same time, all I'm, as, as the previous one, all, all, all I'm saying is that the four medical, the CMOs had all agreed something. So that presumably was unified advice. Well, I think in this particular instance, it wasn't unified advice, and that's why I'm asking to draw your attention to it. It appears to be advice that came from Scotland, and then at a later stage, England followed suit. I don't know. I mean, this was, this was the CMOs. I'm sorry you'd have to ask them this. I wasn't uh, involved in this and don't know exactly what happened. I'm obliged. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mitchell. Mr Dale. Thank you, my lady. Uh, Sir Patrick, I ask questions on behalf of FEMO, the Federation of Ethnic Minority Healthcare Organizations, and I have a clutch of questions for you. Uh, can I invite you first to have a look at paragraph 552 of your witness statement, if it could be brought up, please? Uh, it's at INQ 3323882626. Underscore zero one eight zero. 
Uh, it's the first paragraph of the section of your witness statement entitled uh, COVID-19 Disparities. Uh, and you say this, I was aware that the pandemic and the measures required to tackle it could have an unequal impact. As stated at, at more than one press conference, the virus fed off inequality and drove inequality. It was entirely foreseeable that pre-existing structural and health inequalities within ethnic minority and other vulnerable groups would result in disparities in risk and outcome. Uh, can I ask firstly whether this clear understanding expressed here formed part of the advice to senior decision makers as you uh, and Sir Chris Whitty spoke with them in the period leading up to the first lockdown uh, in March 2020? Uh, I think it was, I mean, it's historically, this is an historically true statement that pandemics differentially affect the most disadvantaged people and they drive further disadvantage and inequality. And this is a statement that describes that. I can't recall exactly when we would have given that advice. And in a sense, it's not really science advice, but it is something that policymakers needed to take into account. And I'm sorry, I don't know exactly when we would have first raised this. I raised it at a press conference pretty early on. I know that. Very well. But you wouldn't be able to say whether this was advice that as a general proposition could be infused or was infused in the type of advice that you would have, would have given? I'm pretty sure that, that Chris Whitty would have said this very early on, but I'm sorry, I don't have any exact date as to when that would have been said. Very well. Uh, could we now turn to one of your diary entries uh, of the 17th of April 2020 at INQ triple zero two seven three nine zero one underscore six zero four, and in the interest of time, I will read uh, what it says. Uh, Yvonne opened up the only two areas we agreed to steer clear of: ethnicity, and in bracket, uh, we don't have the answer yet, she, and and she wasn't even asked the question. And I'll stop there. And my question arising from that is, uh, well, first of all, can you confirm that the reference here to Yvonne is uh, to Professor Yvonne Doyle, uh, then the head of Public Health England? Yes, I think she was the medical director at Public Health England. Uh, and this was at a press conference where you were both appearing? I don't think I was appearing at that conference. Maybe I was, but I can't remember. Th those two were. Maybe I was the third person. Very well. But my substantive question is this. Was the ethnicity issue that you both had agreed to steer clear of uh, the matter of disproportionate death rates among BAME healthcare workers? No. The, the issue was the previous day we'd received preliminary information from a study called COSIN about disproportionate um, proportions of different ethnic minorities in hospitals and outcomes and they weren't quite sure exactly what was happening and why they were seeing it and they'd gone away to undertake some more work urgently to try and understand whether this was a difference in admission to hospital, a difference in outcome in hospital, a different pathway that people were following during treatment or whether it was related to pre-existing comorbidities and underlying illnesses. So there was a piece of work that we'd just seen literally, I think, the afternoon before on the 16th that was due to be um, uh, updated with the information as to what was causing it so we could actually give proper information uh, as to what might be done. OK. So it, it was a very specific set of uh, set of facts or a scenario that that you were talking about. That's that's the reason why you were, you wanted her to steer clear of it. Is that correct? Yeah, because, because we didn't know the question that we were trying to address was to say what happened in hospital. Was this something that was going on in hospital that the same proportion of different ethnic groups were being admitted and then the outcome was worse in hospital, or was it something to do with the admission? 
And was it something to do with underlying disease states which made it worse? We'd seen something that, that didn't look right and we wanted to understand the, 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 the likely underlying causes of that so we could comment on it more effectively. Very well. Uh, I, I, I have to ask you this question. Was, was, would you say, uh, in reflection, uh, that there was any nervousness to speak authoritatively on issues of disparity in health outcome based on ethnicity? No, I think we, well, certainly not from our perspective. We very early on raised this as an issue. We were very keen to see it properly understood. Public Health England undertook work in it and published it. Um, and the ONS also undertook work and published it. So we were keen to actually try and understand what was driving it. And I think quite early on, I don't remember the date, I'm sorry, we came to the conclusion that the likely causes was to do with inequality and to do with uh, issues of health related to inequality rather than to biological differences which were driving this outcome at that stage. Very well. And my final question, uh, is it fair to say that during this time, on or around uh, middle, the middle of April 2020, the matter of disproportionate deaths based on ethnicity was considered more a matter uh, of public messaging, uh, political messaging, uh, rather than, than, than a bona fide issue of public health? No, I think it was seen by the public health people very much as an issue of public health. Um, and uh, that there were obviously pre-existing structural inequalities that were causing a problem. And as I've already said in the previous quote, I, I was worried that not only was there inequality in terms of what the um, effect of the virus was, but the virus itself was then driving even further inequality because of that. So I think this was seen as, as, as absolutely a public health issue. Very well, thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Dale. Mr. Menel. Uh, thank you, my lady. Uh, good afternoon, Sir Patrick. I ask questions on behalf of a number of children's rights organizations. I have a, a few questions on three topics. Firstly, the inquiries heard evidence from a Dr. David Taylor Robinson, a public health expert, to the effect that social isolation for children is totally different than social isolation for adults, as there are critical and sensitive periods in children's development and uh, windows of opportunity, as he called it, in children's lives that you can never get back. Uh, are you aware uh, of any scientific research done for the government during the pandemic on the specific impact of the lockdown rules and restrictions on children as compared to adults? Uh, I don't know of the specific pieces of research that may have been done. We set up a children's task and finish group to look at the question of impacts on children, which involved people from uh, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health and various other organisations to, and was chaired by the Chief Scientific Advisor in the Department for Education to try to understand exactly these questions of um, disproportionate impact, risk to children, and it became the basis of, I think, a very complicated position of relative risks and benefits in children. I, I don't know of specific research that was undertaken then to look at the impact, uh, but Public Health England or, or ONS may have done so. So am I right that you can't assist as to whether any of that work, research or otherwise, was in fact presented to the key operational decision makers in government? Is that oh, right? Oh, no. I, the, the task and finish group, all of their work was fed directly into all of the decision makers, and it was deliberately chaired by the um, chief scientific advisor in the Department for Health to make sure that the officials in the Department for Health could have listened into the group, understand all of the work that came out of it, and it was plugged directly into the um, 
uh, highest levels in the Department for Education and indeed into number 10. So it was considered within the remit of scientific advice being provided to the government, is that right? Yes, it was. Thank you. Secondly, um, in February 2020, did you ask Professor James Rubin and Professor Brooke Rogers to run SPY B? Yes. Um, and did this in turn lead to the creation of a specific subgroup on education that came to be known as SPY Kids? No, that came later, I think, um, and was part of the what started, I think, as a task and finish group to try and undertake a piece of work, and then it morphed into um, Spy Kids, which brought together lots of the people who'd worked on that to become a more regular way of looking at things relating to children. And Spy Kids, for example, produced a, uh, a paper on the role of children in transmitted COVID. Is that right? So in what? In transmitted COVID. Yes. Transmission. Yes. Uh, do you know and um, whether Spy Kids uh, ever researched or considered the wider impact of the government's non-pharmaceutical interventions on children and their long-term social and psychological well-being? Yes, there was a very extensive report published by them on uh, the negative effects of um, MPIs, and there were some very vocal inputs from people around that subject. I think there was I'm not sure about this, actually. There may have been a report from Public Health England as well, but, yes, it was a topic that was... The reason that group was set up was exactly that sort of risk balance between these interventions versus infection. And can you give an approximate date for that? I'm sorry, I'd have to come back to you on that. That's fine. Thank you. Um, and that was subsequently... Was it fed into the key political decision-makers? Yes, all of the outputs from that group would have gone to Department for Education and into Cabinet Office and across Whitehall. And that material would have recognised, I think you're saying, that the, there were differential impacts in relation to non-pharmaceutical interventions vis-à-vis -vis children and adults. Is that right? It was certainly focused on the impacts of school closures on children's mental health and well-being, it also focused on, if I remember correctly, vulnerable children and what the risk they had in relation to isolation and being taken away from services. Uh, I can't be 100% sure it covered all of the MPIs. And just to be, to be um, fair to you about this, in your witness statement at page 113, paragraph 341, we no need to put it on the screen, you say explicitly that school, school closures have obvious, unequal, and potentially long-term detriments on children. Yes. And that's your view, isn't it? And that was the view of that group as well, and that's precisely why it was set up, because in all of these cases, just take a step back, if I may, all of the NPIs carried risks as well as the obvious benefit of stopping spread. Yes. And it's often perceived that somehow they were, they were an easy option whereas stopping the spread was, was the priority. But we were aware at all times that these carried significant risk, and they carried particular risk for children. Thank you. And thirdly and finally, um, I have a question for you about something that appears in your, your handwritten notes. I, I, I don't think I can put this on the screen. I don't think I'm allowed to, but I'll, I'll just give the reference um, for the record. It's INQ 0002800061 page 223. It's a note of yours. I'll just read it to you. It's a note of yours dated the 15th of October 2020, and it reads as follows. Sage pushing for, quote, can't we exempt children from rule of six, end quote. We said no, not unless CO want to revisit. I'll just read it again. Sage pushing for, quote, can't we exempt children from rule of six, end quote. We said no, not unless CO want to revisit. Can you explain that note, please? Uh, I, I, I don't know what context that was in, but it sounds like it was a sage meeting where people wanted to think about whether the rule of six should or shouldn't include children, and Cabin Office didn't want to revisit that policy. And would that view of SAGE uh, 
had been communicated to the Prime Minister or any other government minister at the time? This I is think, October 2020. Well, I think on the rule of six, we were pretty clear that we didn't actually think that that had an enormous basis in anything. In other words, it was, why six, why not eight, why not ten? We couldn't tell anyone which was better or worse, only that the more contacts you had, the more likely it was to create a spreading environment. Exactly how that was organised was a policy matter. And would that... Can you assist as to what the government's response was, if any, to that view that SAGE apparently held in October 2020? I can't recall. Um, I think, if I remember correctly, the government had made a decision that it wanted to stick with six, and that was the policy decision. And it wanted to stick with six in England um, without making any exemption for children, uh, unlike Scotland and Wales, yes. who took a different approach. You know that, don't you? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Sorry you, Mr. Mr. Friedman. Sir Patrick, I act for four national disabled people's organisations. Can I ask you about representation on SAGE and related expert groups? And Mr Dale, uh, to my left for FEMHO, has asked you today about your statement at paragraph 552, that it was entirely foreseeable, in effect, that pandemics as a rule of the greatest impact on those who suffer from pre-existing structure and health inequalities, and we would take it disabled people fall into that category. And today you've called that, quote, an historically true statement. Um, in your module one oral evidence, we needn't go up to it, but it's day eight, 22nd of June, 2023, at page 165, line five to 23, you told the chair on reflection that it was a, quote, terrible, terrible truth and it's something that we all need to reflect on, that all pandemics feed off inequality and drive inequality. And you added that awareness of issues in, of inequality ought to have been, quote, embedded right from day one. It needs to be one of those questions on the first stage, as you put it, what are the issues around inequality that you should be thinking about now in terms of science advice? And you added others need to think about it in terms of operational planning. Now, given that foresight, why was there not more representation of those with insight into the predicament of those groups embedded from day one into SAGE? Well, I think the insight was that that would have been helpful. Um, we didn't do that on day one. We had um, a number of scientists looking at specific areas. I think my statement actually is that there is a policy and operations group within cabinet office that deals specifically with disabilities and inequalities and that's really where this should be driven from we should though have looked at it more in sage i think yeah. so in effect you should have and as it were hm government as your client should have pushed you more to consider it well yeah definitely definitely this is an hm government issue because they have a a, a, a unit that focuses specifically on this and they could have fed us a question. In terms of the science, though, the, 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 the two areas that I think are most important that were repeatedly covered was keep the prevalence low and look out for special institutions. And I'll, I'll pick up one example. In May 2020, we received a piece of work that had been done by a subgroup on forgotten institutions that was specifically looking at those institutions where spread might occur, including residential homes for people with disabilities. That's a sort of science question we can address, but I would argue it's primarily a policy and operations question for a cabinet office unit to think about that. Yep. Well, can I, can I move on about, as it were, prompts then that came within the course of the work? You've just referred to one. Can I just then ask you about the work of the Office for National Statistics that the Chair has seen that, in effect, showed disproportionate impact upon mortality rates and quality of life for disabled people becoming apparent from their papers from June 2020 onwards? Again, it may be a similar answer, but can I just ask you why, when it was recognised uh, 
um, by that time, or there about that time, that SAGE standard committees could benefit from a wider diversity of expertise in terms of inequalities, was no dedicated expertise sought regarding disabled people. I think that ONS survey came out of discussions probably at SAGE, that piece of work, because Ian yeah. Diamond was part, part of the SAGE, who's the National Statistician, part of the SAGE um, group. That clearly is a report that needs to go into central government to, to deal with. As I said, I think, and I said this in my module one, I think this is an area where it should automatically happen in SAGE going forward, and it didn't. I, 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 is that the answer to my question about why no dedicated expertise? Because, because that's, I just want to push you on that. My question is why, when this kind of data is coming out, whether you've been involved in commissioning it or not, is thereafter there's no dedicated expertise sought regarding disabled people into SAGE and its dedicated subgroups? I think the dedicated expertise needs to sit somewhere else and ask questions of SAGE which we can then potentially bring people in if we needed to. But I think there's a danger. I mean, SAGE is not the operational or the policy organisation, and it's not the place where, where these sorts of things need to be turned into action. That may then follow on to my next question, which is, in effect, the work that is commissioned of SAGE, and I take the answers you've already given about this, but you've given a list of, not all, but many of SAGE commissions pieces of work, just for the record, at page 180, at paragraph 554, and it's A to P of your uh, statement subparagraphs. Now, none of the list there is dedicated in its focus to the disproportionate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic upon disabled people. And we found no dedicated SAGE patra of that nature. Now, we understand that SAGE supplies the advice it's asked to supply from HM government. But again, why no dedicated focus? Is it simply that you weren't asked? Well. I'll go back a bit to an answer that um, Professor Kamlish Kunti gave on, in, in, in relation to a similar question, which is the science advice was largely around making sure that the prevalence was low, making sure that those people who are particularly vulnerable were protected, and making sure that there were um, mechanisms to provide that shielding that others needed to put in place were the key things that we needed to do. So many of the papers here are highly relevant in terms of what somebody needs to do, even though we weren't specifically talking about disabilities. That is, again, where the advice from SAGE comes out in terms of science, here are some principles. The operationalization of that needs to be done by teams with a dedicated focus, and I do think that's one that needed dedicated focus. Yes, well, we understand that. We've heard from uh, the Minister for Disabled People in terms of what was done or not done by the disability unit. But if we stand back and we think of the problem, for whatever reason, the HM government is the client and its dedicated units don't ask the question or seek the advice from SAGE, then again, does that not underscore that actually sometimes the expert advisor needs to have people with that focus on its main groups or subgroups in order to prompt its client to think about those kind of matters? Which is why in statement one I said, yes, I think that needs to happen. And, and I think that would have been helpful and we didn't have it. Hmm. And it would be useful going forward to have a specific focus on that question, just to make sure we are getting the right questions coming to us. But I do think it's not a good system for government to rely on a group set up to give science advice, largely filled with academics, to try and plug holes elsewhere. Yeah. Finally, may I ask you about the risk posed by COVID-19 virus to the learning disabled and particularly those with Down syndrome. Uh, Professor Watson and Shakespeare have given evidence to the inquiry to the effect that prior to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, 
it was well established that respiratory disorders are the predominant cause of death for people with an intellectual disability. And hence, those experts on disparities relating to disabled people regard the failure to identify those with intellectual disabilities, and particularly those with Down syndrome, uh, early on as a missed opportunity. Now, again, r r acknowledging to you and reminding myself, SAGE is not directly responsible for these lists of clinically extremely vulnerable and the like. Um, others are in their medical matters. But should those with Down syndrome have been on the clinically extremely vulnerable list throughout the pandemic? And if not, should they have been added sooner than the 2nd of October, November 2020, when we know that revised letters were sent out to GP practices and the various healthcare bodies to that effect? So, so the list of vulnerable and extremely vulnerable was entirely within DHSC yeah. and a matter for the medical community to define it didn't come to SAGE, it wouldn't be expected to come to SAGE, and so I don't think there was any input indirect or direct on that, and nor would I expect there to be. Um, in terms of what do I think, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think it is well understood that um, uh, people with Down syndrome do have an increased infection risk and therefore do carry a vulnerability. Uh, thank you for that. I, I, and I've, I've understood your answer about division of labour on this, but if I could just ask you one more point about it. We, we know, again, it's a separate structure, but the nerve tag, nerve tag Clinical Risk Stratification subgroup in June 2020 had issued papers recognising high risk, at least on the modelling in relation to those with Down syndrome. Uh, again, not asking about responsibility and more asking about looking forward. Given your answer about Down syndrome, uh, should there have been speedier ways to process that recognition of risk from June 2022 November 2020, when we know uh, the nature of the clinically extremely vulnerable uh, list change to include Down syndrome? Well, Nerve Tag is a um, committee of DHSC, and therefore its output's fed directly into DHSC. I think um, they, these questions are really best addressed to somebody in DHSC or the CMO. They, they weren't sage questions. They were very important clinical questions and very important operational matters. But I wouldn't expect them to come to SAGE, and I don't think putting SAGE in the middle of any future plan around this would be a sensible action. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Mr. Jacobs, I'm sorry, last again. Thank you, my lady. So, Patrick, I ask questions on behalf of the Trades Union Congress. Um, it, it, it is important that when giving your answers, at least, you do speak into the microphone so it can pick your voice up. I'm going to ask a few questions about decision-making in respect of schools. Of course, the detail will be the subject of a future module, but I have a, a few questions about um, the general approach to decision-making. And I'd like to start, if I may, with an entry in the inquiry schedule of your notes at 273901 and in particular, page 139. So when it arrives, we're going to be looking at an entry from the 6th of August, 2020, a PM COVID S meeting on schools, quote, don't want to hear about plan B and C for failure. I just want all pupils back at school, unquote. And then a further quote, we are no longer taking this COVID excuse stuff, get back to school. Um, firstly, are those quotes from the Prime Minister, or quotes of what the Prime Minister had said? Uh, it looks like it. Um, the context, of course, Sir Patrick, is um, looking forward to schools reopening um, that September. Is it right also as a point of context that at that time, uh, you and others in, in around July and August 2020 had been raising some concern about the potential path of the virus over the winter months and the risks associated with lifting various NPIs at around that time? Yes, we had raised the risk that prevalence was increasing and would continue to increase and I had commissioned a piece of work from the Academy of Medical Sciences. I'm sorry, I'm going to have my back to you. So, not, not at all. Um, uh, Academy of Medical Sciences on just called winter, uh, 
uh, to take into account this, all of the things that government needs to consider. And um, our view was that the increased lifting of measures would drive an increase in prevalence and that inevitably that starts to put pressure on the remaining things that were open. And therefore, in a sense, there's a trade-off between schools and other things. And certainly for the reasons discussed earlier, our belief was that schools should usually be the last thing to shut because of all the knock-on consequences for children. Yeah. Um, Sir, Pat Sir Patrick, given those consequences, um, schools opening, being open, is obviously hugely important. Um, but, but given also the context around prevalence and R rate, um, were you concerned on, on listening to that observation from the Prime Minister that it was a little perhaps reckless to discourage any careful focus on when a plan B might be needed and focusing exclusively on a plan A? Well, as you might imagine, um, I was rather focused on evidence-based um, plans and that there needed to be a series of scenarios, not a single option. Yes. Um, so, uh, and give us a sense of the importance of those scenarios being considered in advance rather than just holding tight to the plan A of schools open. Well, these are very difficult operational questions that require planning, and we're now straying outside my role, but it's pretty clear that you can't just flip from one plan to another without preparing. Sir so Patrick, you spoke earlier in your evidence about meetings going round in circles. Um, is it quite a simple consequence of having plan A but no plan B or C that one ends up in the face of very difficult issues just going around in circles? It makes it much more of a binary choice, and um, it makes it much more difficult, I imagine, to operationalise if you do need to change. With that in mind, I'm going to look at just, um, I think, two entries in your notes in which you describe subsequent decision-making. Um, the first in the same document is page 181, And this is from the 16th of September, so just six weeks or so after the have a plan A but no plan B or C. And um, there's a reference to the PM saying maybe we should blame ourselves and a re reference to Moonshot, which you've given evidence about. A rare moment of truthful insight. And then you say, complete chaos over schools and what they should do. No one had any answers. Um, so Patrick, give us a sense of what the complete chaos was and why it was that no one had any answers. I, I really don't know. I mean, that was my observation that day. There was obviously a meeting where it didn't sound like they were getting anywhere and there were a lot of things that needed to be addressed. But I'm sorry, I, I don't think I can add anything to what that scribbled note said. Might it have been early indications of the R rate going up? Oh, well, we knew by then the R was increasing and the prevalence was going up, and we were worried about it. Um, were you particularly worried, Sir Patrick, in the absence of a plan B? We were worried that action would need to be taken of some sort, and that needed to be defined. And I think I'm right in saying that five days after this, um, Sir Chris Whitty and I held a press conference where we described what we saw as a, a dangerous emerging situation. Yeah. Um, the next entry is at page 339 of the same document. It's an entry of the 3rd of January 2021. That was a day before primary schools were sent back for one day, wasn't it, Sir Patrick? Um, we, we see it says the NHS in London is in real trouble. The government needs to lock down more firmly and to take the advice on schools. Called Chris and agreed he should pull a group together to listen directly. He is worried about individual extremist views. Schools is a complete mess, largely due to Department for Education. Um, why did you make the observation um, at that stage that schools was a complete mess? 
um, and largely due to the the DfE, the Department for Education. I, I really, I mean, I was obviously frustrated that evening. I was obviously very concerned about the rising rates and that London, I, I do remember, really looked like it was in big trouble at that moment. Um, and that schools were considered to be an important part of the spread of what then I think was the alpha variant that was spreading very rapidly um, throughout the younger part of the population. So I think that's the background to this. I, I really don't know why I said schools is a complete mess largely due to DfE. All I can say is that's clearly what I came away with an impression from the meetings that took place that day. In terms of your impression of meetings, not necessarily that day, but over the course of that first year of the pandemic, um, did you form a view as to the effectiveness of the working relationship between Number 10 and the Cabinet Office and the Secretary of State for Education? I, I had many discussions with the Permanent Secretary at DfE, who was really trying to get on top of this and to understand the advice on schools. And I know there were some very strong views held by the Secretary of State there, and uh, those views were discussed and uh, and and sometimes taken up and sometimes not by number 10 it didn't seem to me that there was necessarily an alignment between what was going on at the political level um, and there was uh, um, attempts by the uh, permanent secretary to try and draw some um, structure to what was happening in dfe around this area you described there wasn't necessarily an alignment um is that a slightly delicate way of putting it, um, how would you describe um, the extent to which there was a, a sense of coherent planning between Number 10 and the Secretary of State for Education? I was worried that the school's planning was not under control and that there wasn't a very um, clear plan as to what would happen uh, and why it was going to happen and how it would be implemented. In terms of trying to understand why it might not have been uh, under control, could we look at page 605 of the same document, the schedule of notes? So we can see an entry in your notebooks from the 11th of June 2020 um, Slater, and just pausing there, is that Jonathan Slater, the permanent secretary at the time that you were just referring to? Yes. Um, Slater basically described keeping Gavin Williamson away from policy development, but give him some illusion of ownership, but not his area and not his expertise. I'm just pausing there before we consider the, the, the remainder of that. Um, did it strike you as dysfunctional that a permanent secretary was, was describing keeping the Secretary of State away from policy development? Uh, well, policy development, I'm not sure, but policy ultimately agreement, yes, that would be unusual. Um, we're deep into the way departments work here, which I'm certainly not familiar with as somebody relatively new to the civil service, but yes, it doesn't sound like a very good setup. Um, was it your impression, uh, you, you were in the room for, for, for many meetings, um, that that sort of dysfunction contributed to the lack of grip or lack of control, which there might have been? I, I wasn't in lots of meetings to do with schools at this operational level, so I, I wouldn't have seen this. I think this is Jonathan Slater talking to me as he's trying to get some science advice, so I, I wouldn't yeah. have seen that. Okay. If we return, finally, just to that entry, it finishes, um, quote, I don't know what Gavin's plan for schools is, but probably pretty, fe pretty feeble, unquote, PM. Um, is that the Prime Minister stating in a meeting in June 2020 um, his view of his Secretary of State for Education. Well, that's a quote which I wrote down on that day from the Prime Minister about the Secretary of State from a meeting. So I think I can't say any more than that other than that's what presumably was said.
to the extent that you are aware from, from being present in meetings, is that indicative of a confidence or, or lack of confidence that key people such as the Prime Minister had in the Secretary of State for Education? I think, I think that's a question that really needs to go to the Prime Minister, but I have to say a lot of these statements seem to fly around number 10 about a lot of people. Which we may have seen. Um, those are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Jacobs. That's all for Sir Patrick. Sir Patrick, again, extremely grateful to you for all your help and your insight and for your patience in staying with us all today. I'm sorry I can't say goodbye as yet. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry for your point of view, um, but um, tomorrow we'll sit again at 10. 10 and then just so people can make their plans, because we've got so much to do this week, I'm sitting at 9.30 on Wednesday and Thursday. Thank you very much.